All right, folks, we'll get settled. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and the unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, the peace and friendship uh, treaties that were signed starting in the 1720s um, are a, a roadmap for our relationship, and we honor those um, at council and I hope uh, the entire municipality. Does somebody want to consider the approval of the minutes of January 24th, Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Kent. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Those are done. The order of business today is uh, that we are going to be uh, looking at the uh, Halifax Regional Police and uh, RCMP uh, Halifax budget. Um, does somebody want to move the order of approval as circulated? Councillor Stoddard? Seconded by Councillor Mason. All in favor? Aye. Carried. Calls. Uh, calls for con uh, declarations of conflict of interest. Um, I am uh, sitting in, I'm Mike Savage, I'm sitting in for Councillor Russell, who is the chair of audit um, and finance, but is also the chair of the committee of the whole budget meetings that we have. Um, if he's watching at home, he continue to wish him well. Um, and uh, so this is a budget committee meeting and it begins with public participation. We have a number of people who've signed up to speak, and uh, so we're going to ask them to come forward now. Um, people will have uh, up to five minutes. Andrea here has the signs. Show them the signs. Uh, we'll be holding up the 30 seconds and then the time. We have a number of people to hear from that we want to hear from today, so we ask people to uh, uh, be strict on the timing. And the first person we're going to hear from is Victoria Levac, uh, who I see there. We're going to give you a chance to get set up, I think, Vicky, if you want. Uh, you got the clerk handling this to make it as convenient as possible. I want to thank everybody who's come down today. Again, everybody will have five minutes. It's not a question and answer session. It is a chance for you to say what you feel. Um, what you speak to here can be brought forward by councillors in debate following. And um, word. Great. Okay, so I'm going to wait for everyone to get settled. Are we good, Mr. Mayor? Good morning, council members and members of the community. Community, I thought about what I'm going to say quite a bit today, um, but I'm a little nervous because 
I fear the words I say won't do any good. But then again, we must always do, we must always stand up for what we believe in. And so I will do my best. And hope my words do not fall upon people who simply feign interest in what I have to say. I know a lot of people have complaints about the help explains worse. I am among them. But rather than explaining why the HRP does not do what I consider to be in the best of public safety, I would rather give you solutions rather than complaints. To that end, I've compiled a list of what I feel and many in my community feel the $5.4 million that is being asked for could be better spent on to improve public safety and well-being. And by this list is by no means exhaustive, but here are some examples of what we could do with that money. After school programs for at-risk youth, community theater and arts programs, community fridges, programs like the Club Inclusion that help people in the disability community, also Prescott Group who provides employment and other ways of interacting with the community for people who have difference in how they see things. Gift places like Out of the Cold and Add Some House for Women and Children. Give more public, more funding to public libraries who provide countless resources at low or no cost. Building a community hub with all the resources that those who are on house could, could it wouldn't, would need to get back on their feet. More community spaces in general where people don't have to spend money in order to spend their time and can simply exist. Buy back lots that are currently unused and put them towards public housing. Putting more money into the public safety officer budget, they have great ideas. Provide grants for people who have ideas about how to better improve our community. Put more money towards public transit. Put more money into the access accessibility budget so we can truly reach the goal of being fully accessible by the year 2030. Or give money to animal shelters. Like I said, this is by no means an exhausted list. And, but all of these things will provide much more benefit to our communities than people with guns. Uh, in closing, I would like to point out that we, as a community, wish to prevent crime, not punish it. And to that end, I ask you to deny the 2024-2025 budget for the, for the police and their increase and the fund community, not cops. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Always good to see you and appreciate your point of view. Uh, next on the list is Emerson Roach, followed by Jamie Livingston and then Eloise Burnett. Emerson. Good Hello. morning. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Emerson Roach. I'm a small business owner and I was born and raised right here in Halifax. 
Before I get into my speech, I want to note that I took time out of my demanding schedule running a small business to speak at the last budget meeting, as well as this one, because I believe that community consultation is an essential part of the democratic process and one that we should be actively engaged in. And I was dismayed to read that Vice Chair Gavin Giles had disparaged the community consultation process, insulting community members like me who had taken hours out of their busy schedules, unpaid, to voice their concerns about the HRP's reckless spending habits and egregious budget request. We have better things to do with our time than come to meetings to titillate and annoy you. And that is a direct quote from Gavin Giles. Uh, we are here because we have to beg to have our voices even recognized by the city. This is a perfect example of why the HRP has fundamentally lost the trust of the citizens of Halifax. Over and over again, we've pushed for reform, for transparency, for accountability, only to be met with hostility. The, peace, the police have sought to preserve their salaries above all else, even when it means causing active harm to the community, even when their budget could be better allocated to social services that would actually solve the problems at the root of crime. We need to treat the underlying disease, not the symptoms. We know that police presence does not deter or prevent crime. A 2020 journalistic investigation into 60 years of police spending across America found no correlation between higher police spending and a reduction in crime. A 2024 University of Toronto study of 20 of Canada's largest municipalities, including Halifax, analyzed police budgets and crime levels over an 11 year period and found that an increase in police funding had no consistent correlation with crime rates. What does tangibly decrease rates of crime? Decades worth of studies say that the most effective deterrents of crime are access to stable income, safe housing, and mental and physical health care. Additional factors that can help prevent crime are early childhood intervention programs such as food support and parental coaching, free vocational and educational training opportunities, grassroots community-led organizations, as well as some very basic public amenities like adding street lights, funding free social gathering spaces such as libraries, public parks, and community drop-in spaces. All of these have been statistically proven to reduce crime rates for violent and non-violent crime alike. I would also like to address that part of the HRP's proposed budget increase cited the need for more officers specifically to respond to mental health calls, which have taken a sharp upturn in the past few years. But experts from a variety of fields are actually calling for the police to be detasked from mental health calls. In fact, the report from the Mass Casualty Commission on the 2020 mass shooting in Portapique recommended that the province establish a mental health care model for urban and rural areas that eliminates the practice of using police as the sole first responders to mental health calls. Halifax Regional Police only receive 40 hours of crisis inter intervention training, as opposed to mental health professionals and social workers who train for years in crisis intervention. Coupled with the fact that only about half of the Halifax Regional Police Force have actually received that training as of June 2023, that was the most recent number that I could find, you should be able to understand why this is woefully inadequate. And it is not just the community at large that is calling for the police to remove themselves from mental health crisis response, but also the police themselves. In May of 2023, Jeff Christie, the chief superintendent of the RCMP, said that the police can't be the mobile mental health response team. They just can't. Chief Dave McNeil with the Truro Police has said, this isn't the type of work that we sign on to do, and it's not the type of work that we're actually trained well to do. Deputy Chief Danny McPhee with the Bridgewater Police Service said, we're not full-time mental health case workers. We don't have that experience from working full-time. That's not our profession. If the police are so concerned that they're being forced to act outside of their mandate on mental health calls, they would petition for changes to the Nova Scotia Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act, which requires officers to remain on site with patients who have been detained and brought to hospital. But that wouldn't pad the budget, would it? To summarize, our tax dollars need to go towards addressing the actual root of crime and working towards actual crime prevention, which includes funding various social services and detasking police from mental health calls, as well as allowing actual professionals to take on the work that they were actually trained for, not police. We need real sustainable solutions, not an increasingly militarized police presence designed to punish and intimidate citizens who are experiencing mass suffering due to policy failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emerson. I understand that Jamie Livingston is now uh, coming in uh, virtually. Uh, Madam Clark, is that the case? Okay. All right.
None of those folks look like Jamie Livingston. Should we work on this and go to the next uh, speaker? What do you think? I believe so, Chair. Okay. All right. We'll try to get Jamie on uh, video. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Eloise Burnett, followed by Collins Ellison and Joanne Hussey. Uh, Eloise? The note says pending. Maybe Eloise is not with us. We'll try to come back. Uh, Collins Ellison followed by Joanne Hussey and uh, Ryan Federko. Collins Ellison, are you here? Not here at the moment. Okay, Joanne Hussey. Joanne is here. Joanne followed by Ryan Federko and Lou Campbell. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Joanne. Uh, I live in District 10 in Halifax Bedford Basin and I was one of the 715 individuals who signed the open letter that you received. So I'm speaking today as an individual. I've also taken time off work to be here, uh, but I have been involved in work related to housing, to politics and social justice in Halifax for most of the past 20 years. Uh, I care a lot about evidence-based decision-making and using public spending to maximize public good, uh, which makes me so much fun at parties. Um, but it, it's from that perspective that I'm asking council to reject the requested increase of almost $6 million to the 2024-25 Halifax Regional Police budget. Um, I expect that I'm not going to say anything that you haven't already heard and that you don't already know. Um, I know that you've already been, been pointed towards the article published in Volume 49, Issue 4 of the Journal of Canadian Public Policy, which analyzed the data around police and, and crime uh, and found no consistent associations between police funding and crime rates across municipalities in Canada and overall that net increases in spending per capita were not associated with greater net decreases in crime rates. So there's no evidence that larger police budgets will increase the safety or well-being in our communities. Like many of the folks that you're going to hear from today, I support the recommendations of the Defunding the Police report prepared by the Board of Police Commissioners Subcommittee and those thoughtfully put forward in the final report by the Mass Casualty Commission. The defunding the police report is really clear that defunding the police is not about making cuts to the police budget just for austerity's sake. It's about making legislative and policy reforms that promote community safety, tying police budgets to actual performance measures, and decreasing budget allocations to police while increasing budget allocations to safety promoting community building resources that are chronically underfunded. So those principles are repeated in the Mass Casualty Commission report. That report calls for the community and not the police to be at the center of a modernized community safety and well-being model and for the police to serve as a collaborative partner, not the primary actor. That report calls for a shift in community safety budgets to focus on prevention activities. Um, I want to quote from one of the lessons learned in the Mass Casualty Commission report that I think is really important. They said that naming and countering the operation of misogyny, racism, homophobia, and other inegalitarian attitudes within policing must be placed at the heart of strategies to improve everyday policing. If police continue to disbelieve women, operate in ignorance about how violence and trauma present, and work in a silo rather than as a coordinated community safety system, the problems that were documented in that report will persist. So continuing to make significant annual increases in funding to that kind of policing is not the way forward. 
So we have the research and we know which practices are supported by the evidence. And I'm asking you to make an evidence-based decision and direct public spending towards the areas of greatest benefit. So those would involve investments in civilian-only mental health crisis intervention teams, increasing support for emergency shelters and street outreach programs, increasing funding for youth programs. Safe communities are communities where everyone has enough income to pay for the things they need, safe and affordable shelter, and access to enough nutritious food. So safe communities are communities where, where people are healthy and have increased well-being. Um, we need to invest in that. We don't need more cops. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our uh, folks in the gallery who are sharing with their hands. I, we notice that and appreciate that. I think we're good to try to go back to our uh, guest virtually, uh, Jamie Livingston, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Jamie, are you with us? I think so. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thanks. My name is Dr. Jamie Livingston. <laughs> I'm a criminologist and resident of District 8. Today I'll be speaking in opposition to the proposed substantial increase to the budgets of Halifax's police services. Uh, with my time, I'm gonna highlight three areas of concern. First, that increased police spending is neither an effective or evidence-based approach for preventing crime or enhancing community safety as your previous speakers have highlighted. Not only does peer-reviewed criminological research indicate this over decades, but the pattern of crime rates and police spending in our municipality clearly demonstrate this. Police budgets in, each, in HRM have increased every year for at least the past decade and show no association with whether crime rates have trended up or trended down. So if your goal is to address crime and improve community safety in HRM, the research indicates that this won't be effectively achieved by increasing the size of a police force. It's fiscally prudent to invest our limited resource, resources and public dollars in evidence-based crime prevention approaches. So this brings me to my second area of concern. In March last year, City Council voted to approve HRM's public safety strategy which established strategic priorities for improving community safety in our municipality. This strategy is informed by actual evidence, crime prevention evidence, and the needs of our community. It calls for investing in a spectrum of downstream programs to build the social conditions of safety, some of which Vicki Levac nicely spoke to previously, and to develop alternative models for responding without the police to non-criminal matters such as houselessness and mental health crises. The public safety strategy does not call for increasing the size of the police force. The proposed budget increase will divert significant resources away from meeting the strate strategic priorities of the public safety strategy, and I believe will move HRM further away from achieving its legislative mandate to develop and maintain viable and safe communities. My third and final area of concern is that the proposed budget increase is not aligned with the needs and values of the community. This is demonstrated in the extensive community consultations that went along with the public safety strategy, the defund the police report, as well as the mass casualty commission's final report, to name a few. Also, an open letter has been submitted and signed by hundreds of individuals and organizations in HRM who call on you to reject this significant budget increase. Further, at pub public consultations held recently by the Board of Police Commissioners, there was strong opposition to the proposed budget increase. It should cause great concern that public input was wholly ignored by the majority members of a board that has a legislative duty to incorporate community values needs and expectations into their decisions. So in closing, I respectfully urge you to fit, make a fiscally prudent decision to reject the proposed police budget increase. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your time and uh, for your letter as well. Thank you uh, very much. Um, okay, I'll just see, is, is Eloise Brunette here? Collins, Collins Ellison? Okay, we'll go to Ryan Federko, Lou Campbell, and Madison Gelder. Ryan Federko. Oops. 
that was going to be in person, was it, uh, Madam Clerk? Oh, yes, Marcella. Okay. Uh, Lou Campbell? Sorry, excuse me, Mayor. Um, Ryan Perduca was actually a virtual speaker. Okay. Let's see if we can bring him in. Uh, yes. Bring, uh, Ryan in. for the event. However, I'll be speaking. My name is Pat Bouchard, and I'll be speaking on behalf of the National Police Federation. Okay. Uh so, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for the police. I don't have that on the list. Is no. Um, so, Ryan Perduto was going to be speaking on behalf of the National Federation of Police. Um, so, our current speaker here is speaking on okay. behalf. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the confusion. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Pat Bouchard. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the Director of the Atlantic Region, on behalf of the National Police Federation. The National Police Feder Federation represents 20,000 RCMP members serving across Canada and internationally, including 190 RCMP officers here in the Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, the NTF is focused on improving public safety to all Canadians, including members, by advocating for much needed investment in public safety continuum to enhance safety and livability of the many communities we serve, including Halifax. I'm here to speak about and to ask you to support the Halifax Regional Department uh, RCMP's much needed funding request for 1.1 million in the upcoming 2024, 2025 fiscal year for the hiring of six new officer positions. This include two new intimate uh, partner violence investigator to support victims of intimate partner violence and four general duty members. In our view, this is the minimum investment HRM should make to enhance public safety and ease pressures on current Halifax Regional Detachment RCMP members. Perhaps most significantly, this request is being made to reduce the decline in the ratio of police officers to the HRM's population, commonly referred to as the cop to pop ratio. Over the last number of years, Halifax RCMP cop to pop ratio has been getting smaller and smaller and currently sits at 96.4 officers per 100,000 people. By HRM staff estimates, if current funding levels remain stable, HRM's RCMP cop to pop ratio will be the lowest in the country by 26-27 compared to other cities with over 100,000 people. It's important to note that the national average in 2022 was 181 and the Nova Scotia average was 184 officers per 100,000 people. Even with this new six officers, the Halifax Regional Detachment RCMP will be substantially under the provincial and national average. These statistics are alarming and present a significant risk to public safety as it can ultimately result in longer wait times for police service, reduced police visibility in communities, and affect immediate backup times. These low RCMP officer rates also affect officer wellness. Each of our members is being asked to do more with less, respond to more calls for service, work additional overtime shift hours, and forego the necessary time off required for police officers to live with a healthy work-life balance. And this turn results in officers experiencing burnout and clinical mental health challenges over time. Ultimately, this contributes to a, clinic, a, a cyclical problem of reduced staffing rates because it results in even more officers requiring time off for sick leave, which in turn exacerbates the lack of officers available for duty. Uh, being a police officer for 22 years, I can tell you that police work is hard on our minds, hard on our bodies, and hard on our souls. In addition to officer wellness, this investment in the RCMP will also provide good financial value to the Halifax Regional Municipality. As part of HRM's contract with Nova Scotia Provincing Policing Service Agreement, the city benefits from 30% federal contribution to the municipality overall, uh, their policing costs. With this agreement, the all-in cost per officer is $179,000, is of incredible value to the city, given that other municipalities are paying well over $200,000 per officer. Additionally, the RCMP also provides 24 specialized services to the city and to the HRP at little to no cost. Uh, lastly, this request also follows numerous policing reform reports and studies. It is in line with the recent Price Waterhouse Coopers policing transformation report that was delivered to council in April 2023. 
the Mass Casualty Commission report from March 2023, and the HRM's Public Safety Strategy 2023 24 25 26 Prevent and Reduce Crime. This, re this request should be viewed as a positive and gradual first step towards a new path towards more progressive, innovative, and safer Halifax community. In conclusion, we urge the Halifax Regional Council to approve the HRD RCMP's funding request so that more police resources can be added to the city's current RCMP complement and enhance its, police, enhance its policing service to residents. Thank you again for this chance to highlight the importance of this investment, and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Uh, I'd like to just uh, take a moment to speak to some of the uh, concerns that were raised by other citizens um, that say that not necessarily more police officers uh, result in uh, crime reduction, and they're correct. However, uh, the excuse efficiency- me, Folks, 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 excuse me. Uh, Mr. Federico, the time is up. We appreciate you uh, uh, coming to uh, speak with us today uh, virtually. Thank you. Um, okay, Lou Campbell, Madison Geldert, Kevin Russell, and we ask you when you come up just to confirm your name and the community you live. Lou Campbell. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Oh, hello, good. Hi, my name is Lou. I live in District 8. Um, like many of my community members, I'm here to uh, emphatically state my position against in the increase to the police budget. Um, and I'm here to speak about uh, refunding social services with that money instead. And um, I've noticed that there's going to be some repetition. You're going to hear some things again and again. And I, I just ask you to see that as how passionate we are and really like tune into those things rather than tuning out. That repetition shows that we've done our research, so please just see that as how passionate we are. Um, there are many valuable insights into why raising police budgets is not a good use of taxpayer money. Uh, Halifax's social services are in dire need, and you hear a lot of talk about defunding the police, but let's try and switch that to refunding social services. Um, what if instead of the police receiving five million seven hundred and eighty-seven thousand one hundred more dollars, making their total budget ninety-eight million one hundred and thirty-two thousand one hundred dollars, we funneled that money into things that actually prevent crime? Oftentimes, these discussions uh, come up, and rise in crime is brought up as a reason to justify giving more money to the police, and that's because people are afraid and they think that cops are the solution to that fear but evidence shows that they are not. Uh, someone already talked about a study that was released just this year by U of T, saying that there's no consistent associations between police funding increase and crime rates going down. So increasing police does nothing to address the root causes of crime. And we have so many glaring issues just outside. You can see an encampment. The housing crisis is so bad. Child poverty rates are higher than they've been in 30 years and people can't afford to buy food. Um, not only are these issues important, but they actually affect crime rates because desperation leads to crime. So what can the municipality do? What could we do with that money that would have a positive impact? One massive factor that contributes to desperation is the grocery prices skyrocketing. Um, in fact, there are cops in grocery stores right now because shoplifting has become such a problem because people are starving. So what if that money that we paid to those cops went to addressing that. Uh, just yesterday, a food strategy plan was presented to council called the Just Food Action Plan that would increase food security in this city. That total cost for that was $856,000, but it was declined to improve that action plan and instead they decided to break the budget down line by line before approving it, saying that it wasn't affordable and saying that food security is not your jurisdiction. Why is it that year after year, police budget increases are pushed through without question, and then an $856,000 food security request is denied? This is a clear example that it's not about what we can afford, it's about what we prioritize. Access to affordable food should be one of our highest priorities. There are people who are having to choose between feeding themselves and paying rent. The municipality should be doing whatever it can to manage this. Food isn't the only thing that deserves to be prioritized over policing. 
Mental health crisis response could be something we look into, another way to detask the police. The entire Street Navigator program only costs $345,000 a year. You could invest in better and lower cost transit, better snow removal, look at how badly we need that. Libraries could be open longer, more holistic response to the issue of homelessness. These are just a few suggestions, but there are a multitude of ways that that money could be better spent that would have a much more positive impact on our city. You just need to actually make the leap. You've already done some of the work. The defunding report was commissioned and completed. So you have what you need to start to refund social services. You just need to have the bravery and the imagination to actually do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is Madison here? Madison Geldert here? <coughs> Then we'll go to Kevin Russell, Krista Lowen, and Mike Burgess. Kevin Russell. Good morning, um, um, Mayor Savage, councillors, and uh, members of the Board of Police Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present on the proposed 2024-2025 police budget. The Investment Property Owners Association of Nova Scotia, IPONS, has been the voice of responsible private sector rental provi housing providers since 1978. Our members reflect the diversity of those in the private sector who provide rental housing in Halifax Regional Municipality from large organizations owning thousands of units to smaller operators for whom this is their sole livelihood. I would like to begin by uh, by quoting from my January 24th, 2024 budget presentation to mayor and councillors, to conclude, the Investment Property Owners Association of Nova Scotia does not want, does, does want to support one expenditure increase. Police is a core service of municipal government. Our members and many tenants who live in our member properties are facing increased threats of violence from bad tenants who break the law, destroy property and threaten staff and other tenants. Many of the owners and staff who are threatened are women, newcomers, and, and racialized persons. We need our policing services properly supported. When someone breaks the law, someone is available to take the call and respond. IPONS members have observed a, a surge in violence and disruptive behavior among uh, tenants during a COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Incidents of violence and problematic tenant con conduct escalated uh, to, to uh, escalate due to measures under the province's state of emergency which prohibited actions to evict tenants. Although well-intentioned, these measures led to abusive behavior by some tenants who knew they could do anything without consequences. Unfortunately, even after the state of emergency was lifted, the incidents persisted and worsened. The combination of increasing numbers of tenants grappling with a range of issues coupled with rental housing providers lacking access to comprehensive support services led to an unsafe work and uh, work living environments, putting the safety of property owners, staff, and residents at risk. The absence of enforcement compliance under the Residential Tenancies Act, along with a lengthy resolution, resolution process taking six to nine months, leaves rental housing providers in need of protection. They require confidence that when contacting the police, not only will there be a response, but also the dispatch of appropriately trained officers equipped to handle any encountered situation. In light of these challenges, we emphasize the importance of properly funding our policing services. This support ensures that law enforcement can promptly and effectively respond to calls, whether they involve threats to owners, staff, residents, whether it's criminal activities or individuals undergoing mental health episodes. We appreciate your attention to our submission and thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the next three speakers are Krista Lowen, Mike Burgess, and Jesse Hatch. Krista. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Krista. She, her, and I'm opposed to the budget increase for the Halifax Police and RCMP. As a Masters of Social Work student, I've walked alongside folks who have been navigating mental health and the carceral system and see how they are increasingly one in the same. And I'm concerned about the surveillance approach to mental health interventions within this city. To amplify the voices of those with lived experiences in the downtown east side, I will quote from a report. A police-based approach to social problems can only worsen the crisis. 
The central role given to the police in this process will only entrench the problematic stereotyping and criminalization of marginalized people, people who need real community supports and real economic and social empowerment. Yet it is the police, rather than the people most affected, who continue to be empowered in today's political climate. A shift in government priorities would mark a first step in addressing the mental health challenges we all face. In particular, we envision real moves in the direction of defunding the police arm of the state and funding real housing and social supports for people's empowerment rather than people's oppression. It's unacceptable for the municipal government to fail to use the powers that they have to implement social change and then to blame the victims of its own failed policies. Thank you for considering the harmful impact this budget increase will have on this community. Thank you, Krista. Um, Mike Burgess, followed by uh, Jesse Hatch. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mayor, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council, members of the Board of Police Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mike Burgess. I'm a landlord from North End Dartmouth for over 40 years. And I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to your members this morning in support of the uh, increased budget for the police. For over 40 years, I've provided affordable housing in Dartmouth. Dartmouth North has had a bad reputation in the past, but today I wanted to share my observations and experiences in focusing on the Pinecrest and Brule Street areas where some of my buildings are located. In this neighborhood, it's home to many residents on disability income, income assistance, and they struggle from day to day. Many of the people live alone and are single parents. They live with mental health issues. Substance use and substance abu abuse causes its own set of problems. In 2004, I bought uh, one of nine boarded up buildings in the community. When we began working on resurrecting the 12 unit building, Within an hour of removing a board off a first window, a 12-year-old neighborhood boy had thrown a rock through an exposed window. Within days, that building was broken into and over $6,000 worth of tools were lost. They were never recovered. It was during this time that I met Chris Fries, who was HRPD's first uh, community officer of the city. When he retired, the position was handed off to Randy Wood, who through his passion for the community evolved and grew the role uh, exponentially. Over the years, I've been fortunate to work with Randy and his other, other, others who would uh, follow in that role. Through my interactions with them, I've learned the profound and pro pro positive impact in their dedication and presence, presence that can make in the community. This neighborhood's had an abundance of thefts, gangs, drugs, violence, including murders over the years. The response to the officers have been supportive and committed to the community. I've been witnesses to the challenges that they face and the dangers that they're sometimes placed in while doing their jobs to protect us. Sometimes the police are criticized and judged. We've seen that here this morning. Um, uh, but my experience when there's been problems over the years, HRPD has been there. Their jobs are difficult, dangerous, and challenging. But in order to continue their good work, it's essential that Halifax Police have the resources and the manpower to support to be effective. As our population continues to grow, on an ongo the ongoing problems we already face with drugs, poverty, mental illness will only multiply. To meet these demands and avoid an increase in crime, it's imperative that the department have the resources it needs to do their job. It's vital that the appropriate investment in the police force not be depreciated or overlooked. An appropriate investment must be made. I appreciate you inviting me to speak today or having the opportunity to, to present my, my views. And in closing, I wish to say thank you once again for all the members and your dedication to the, and support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jesse Hatch, followed by uh, Trina James and uh, Oiku Sue Gurler. Uh, Jesse, or Jess, I think it's Jesse. Good morning. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm a, dis a resident of District 7. I'm here to voice my strong opposition for the HRP budget and budget increase. 
It is truly wild to me that we're having a conversation about budget increases to the police in 2024. Let's consider that we're having a consultation about raising an already overinflated budget despite years of defunding work that's been done in the city. After thousands of people took to the streets in Halifax during the summer of 2020 to protest the ongoing brutalization of black and brown people at the hands of police and to demand defunding, and after the violent encampment evictions in 2021 for which we still have seen no accountability or transparency. Yet the HRP continue to be granted budget increases year after year. So today I want to talk specifically about the realities of detasking, you can envision it. This year the HRP are requesting a second console position for the hate crime unit. In Nova Scotia, the majority of hate crimes are motivated by race or ethnicity and most target black people. Hate crimes remain significantly underrepresented, largely, or sorry, underreported, largely due to fear of violence or repri reprisal from police, which is not surprising. What reason do people from racialized communities and other marginalized groups have to trust that the police will believe their experience? After decades of police brutality and racial profiling, why would we expect people to report hate motivated crimes to a government body that enacts the same kind of violence? And why do we continue to fund it? The HRP are saying that this requested HCU officer, in addition to the diversity and equity officer, will be working to connect with community members. But in the context of historic and ongoing over-policing of marginalized communities, I struggle to understand what this kind of relationship building looks like, especially when we have no information on the cultural backgrounds or competencies of the HCU officers. So here's an alternative. Similarly to detasking police from victim services, you can detask police from hate crime reporting by implementing third-party reporting systems. They're already successfully in place in other cities and jurisdictions, and they allow people to report hate crimes at places of safety, like community centers, in their places of worship, at libraries, or using hotlines. Next, I want to talk about detasking police for mental health calls. So in 2022, Toronto began piloting a community-led solution to respond to mental health crisis calls and wellness checks. Mobile crisis support teams consisting of crisis workers with crisis intervention and de-escalation training are dispatched to crisis calls instead of police. In the first six months of the pilot, they respond to 3,000 calls and they involve police 2.5% of the time, which tells me that police are unnecessarily responding to roughly 97% of the mental health calls that they attend. That is dangerous. It's a huge waste of public funds that could be better redirected and it doesn't warrant the creation of 12 new positions in Halifax. People who use drugs are con consistently over-policed and over-incarcerated, especially black people, indigenous people, women and trans people, and sex workers. In March of 2021, Vancouver applied to Health Canada for an exemption to the CDSA, which allowed them to decriminalize possession within city limits. It follows a health-based approach to the overdose crisis and recognizes that criminalizing drugs results in death. By funding policy that reduces health inequities for people, they are able to eliminate charges for possession and save lives by redirecting people to harm reduction services instead. That's another example of detasking. We are not asking you to be revolutionaries or to reinvent the wheel. We're asking you to work in the best interest of the people who elected you to bring about the kind of changes that have already been implemented by far more courageous public officials in other cities and for which there's a mountain of evidence to support. So from the defunding report, I wanna quote, diverting a substantial portion of the police budget to other community <laughs> services with health people in need of additional supports, justice and equity is a commitment to actions which prevent crimes from ever happening and addresses the need of people who are most vulnerable. It's a move away from a punitive vision of justice to a vision of justice that is centered around an ethic of care. And I also want to quickly mention that having a representative from the union for police feels deeply inappropriate to me and a pretty obvious conflict of interest. His bills literally get paid by this increase. Um, and I also want to mention that when the social service organization that I work for had our funding cut by 20% this year, despite it being our best year yet in numbers, I definitely was not allowed to come to talk to council about that. So maybe we could consider vetting people uh, who are joining. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Trina James. Is that a virtual? Uh... Uh, yes, here's that. Okay, we'll see if we can get. Uh... Mm -hmm. Sorry, Councillor Lovelace. Yes, thank you. I just have a question for the previous speaker, Mr. Mayor. All right, could we ask um, Jesse to come back? Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much for coming back. I just have a quick question for you because the last thing that you just said was quite concerning. Yeah. Um, that your budget had been cut, but I just need a clarification that Halifax Regional Municipality does not fund your organization. My organization is provincially funded. Um, it provides employment services. 
I don't think that's the main takeaway of what I said, though, which is all. Oh, no, that's, I just need a clarification. I'm sorry, because I was just trying to understand um, how HRM was funding your organization. If we were, I was not aware that we were. So I just wanted to clarify that. Questions for clarification? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I appreciate your time today, and I really sincerely appreciate you being here to speak. Thank you. That was the My question. Okay, thank, oh, thank you. Thank you for coming back. Uh, do we have uh, Trina James online? I'm here. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here at uh, Budget Committee, and uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Trina. I live in District 7. I also work with ATSUM for Women and Children, an organization in the city that supports women, gender diverse people, and families who are unhoused and navigating insecure housing. I'm against increasing the police budget. Last fall, I was privileged enough to attend the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness Conference that took place in the city. From my knowledge, a handful of city workers were also in attendance in hopes for them to learn how to better support this community. During the conference, many of the attendees discussed the harms experienced by community members during police interactions. Two of the presenters, one from Montreal, another one from Toronto, shared their findings after interviewing officers working for the Toronto Police Service. All the officers interviewed mentioned they are not equipped to respond to calls to support people in crisis and feel that other community organizations are better equipped to address their immediate as well as their long-term needs. In addition to that, I also attended one of the virtual budget consultation meetings that took place in the fall where the Halifax Regional Police themselves expressed concerns about being under-equipped to support mental health calls and mentioned that most of an officer's time was spent in hospital with community members, an act that is extremely overwhelming for a person in crisis. A budget increase of over $5 million to fund more officers in the city is not going to support us. It is only going to over-police the problem and under-support the root of this issue. Our city needs to invest in solutions that will address food insecurity. We have a need for more free and affordable programming for youth and adults. We need better supports and services for unhoused people in our community and real mental health supports that do not involve the police. The need to invest in these resources to address the various social issues in our city is so apparent in every single corner, especially given today where people staying in encampments were just given an eviction notice to leave as of February 26. The officers in the city have already stated that they are not equipped and cannot properly support community members experiencing mental health crisis and the community has consistently and historically stated that we do not want police supporting us during mental health crisis. At the end of 2023, on December 31st at 2.20 p.m., a 19-year-old black man by the name of, by the name of Afolabi Stefan Opaso was murdered by Winnipeg police when his friends called 911 pleading for him to receive mental health supports. This did not happen. Instead of receiving mental health supports, this 19-year-old student studying at the University of Manitoba was insidiously gifted an early grave. I and many other community members who are present both in person and virtually will continue to denounce a police budget increase because police have not and will never be able to protect and serve our community. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate that very much. Our next speaker is... Uh... Oiku Sugerler, followed by Tynan Bramberger virtually, and then Isaac Wright. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hi, my name is Oiku Sugerler. I'm a resident of District 5, and uh, I work in District 7 uh, addressing f f gaps in food insecurity among students. Uh, I am also here today taking a day off work uh, serving st students free food because I am concerned by the proposed budget increase. Uh, and what it means to our community. I am all, uh, I've, I'm here to oppose the additional increases to the police budget and advocate for redirecting funds to other city projects that address community safety more efficiently. In a time of unprecedented housing and food crisis in the city, we need proactive measures to ensure that the community is safe and have resources to combat housing crisis, mental health crisis, and emergency sh situations created by the climate, climate change uh, that we're facing which the HRP spoke to in their 
uh, proposal for a budget increase. Allocating more funds to a department that does not center solving, com that does not center community care um, is not a good use of public funds. I recognize that the population increase um, will mean that incre increased mental health crisis, increased housing crisis and issues that arise with that, and even uh, increased hate crimes, which is also cited in their uh, Robert report demanding mo a budget increase. Um, however, as a city council, you have the responsibility to look at the best ways to tackle these issues through your funding decisions. Hiring new officers for a body that, does, that has been created to prevent crime and disorder, whose focus is not to systemically address committee issues, but to prevent crime, uh, would just mean more criminalization of committee members in crisis rather than solving these issues. I would also like to echo uh, previous speakers that it would be fiscally responsible to address issues um, raised by community members through more funds to the HRP. I don't believe that the funds requested by HRP will be used efficient, efficiently once granted. Uh, the Board of Police Commissioners, as you know, has no day-to-day -day oversight on how this money will be spent, and I believe that they did not um, create the necessary policies to detach the police as laid out by the defending the police report created by the subcommittee of the Board of Police Commissioners. By agreeing to increase budget, the city sends a clear message that it prioritized policing of its community over its care. Uh, once again, it's fiscally responsible to give giving funds to this body uh, governed by Board of Police Commissioners, which has, which again, does not say, have a say in how efficiently the money is spent and again, fail to create policies uh, to test the poli police. This increase, as for the HRP, does not exist in a va vacuum. There are so many other projects funded by the city that will need increased budget as both population grows and housing crisis and food crisis in the city uh, will become more complex. Just because we have not created, the city has not put the energy in creating alternatives to the HRP in response to emergency crisis, um, does not mean that we should um, just give more funds to the HRP one every time uh, the demand for it increases. Um, that's all for me. I think my peers spoke way better on the evidence-based approaches to why we should not give HRP uh, more funding. I believe that you should seek out more alternative measures and stop giving the police money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tynan Bramberger is joining us, I believe, virtually. We'll see if we can connect with Tynan. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, good morning. Uh, I live in District 10 here in Halifax, and I work as a registered psychotherapist in Canada, including uh, here in Halifax. It is from my experience as a mental health professional that I'm urging the city of Halifax not to increase the police budget, but rather to reallocate funding from police to our housing and health sectors to address the root causes of what the city deems criminal activity, uh, very much in line with the uh, majority, I would note, of speakers that have spoken today. So I, I kind of take a, a slightly uh, different angle. I, I want to invite you to imagine living under the strain of not knowing where you're going to live next month or next week. I want you to imagine not having enough food in your belly to think or move your body. Imagine living in a world that is unrelentingly hostile to you because of the color of your skin or because of who you love or because of the work that you do, and that this makes it impossible to trust the intention of others. Now I want you to imagine having a mental health breakdown because of one or all of these things are happening at the same time, and someone gets scared by your justified feelings of fear and panic living under these conditions. Imagine this person calls someone with a bulletproof vest and a gun to come yell at you to calm down until you relinquish or worse, until you are pushed to panic further and defend yourself, resulting in getting shot or strangled on the ground because you psychologically, physiologically, and spiritually cannot comply. In 2020, I had the honor of working on a campaign with other mental health professionals to urge our colleges to discourage and mandate that 9 not uh, or 911 not be called in mental health checks due to the violence and death of our patients at the hands of police. 
You can learn more about this campaign at endpoliceinvolvementinmentalhealth.ca if you'd like. I would like to read to you some modified excerpts from our original letter to our colleges and government officials that are highly relevant to the Halifax police budget. Black, indigenous, indigenous and racialized people in our communities experience disproportionate amounts of violence at the hands of police. There is clear, indisputable evidence that involving police can and does lead to harm and or death of Black, Indigenous, and racial, racialized people during mental health checks specifically. I'm not just talking about general involvement with police, but specifically during mental health checks. Vulnerable groups such as two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer people, sick and disabled people, neurodiverse people, people engaged in sex work, migrant workers, refugees, undocumented people, homeless or street-involved people, people who use drugs, or anyone who may have previous harmful interactions with police, a history of trauma in psychiatric care, the child welfare system, or a history in the carceral system, are all also subject to disproportionate police violence. One of the most horrifying cases of death by the hands of police that I read during this campaign was a black man who was deaf and didn't respond to a police officer calling to him because he was deaf. And that man died. He wasn't harmed. He wasn't inconvenienced. He was killed. I go on. Policing in Canada and Halifax alike, alike is a public health crisis. And policing should be replaced with an alternative, community-based mental health and mobile crisis response service, whose personnel are properly trained, trauma-informed, and competent in de-escalation and intervention during a mental health crisis to ensure risk of further harm, to ensure risk of further harm is minimized. Lastly, at the African Nova Scotian Justice Symposium held in the fall of 2023, the data from rigorous research was overwhelming and very much reviewed by many of the people here today. Budgetary increases to police, including diversity hiring and sensitivity training, do not address the blatant and rampant racism reflected in our carceral systems in the short or long term. I want to add and respond to Pat Bouchard's comments about the budget uh, supporting officers that respond to domestic violence. I work not only as a psychotherapist, but specifically as a sex and relationship therapist. Never in my pro professional experience have I ever heard from any of my clients or colleagues that police were a supportive, safe, or effective response to domestic violence. What I have heard from my colleagues and clients were how police exasperated conflict, escalated violence, either before, during, or after the incident of domestic violence, and offered little to no additional resources that would promote the health and safety of those experiencing domestic violence. Additionally, fear of police and uncertainty about where else to turn to has ask also you to, impacted to wrap up my the client's decision Biden? making. If you are concerned about domestic violence, invest in de-escalation mental health workers and programs that practically support people who need to leave homes of violence and get on their feet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. The next three speakers are Isaac Wright, Willa Oaks, and Nancy Hunter. Isaac, are you you're here? Yeah. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Isaac Wright. I'm a resident of District 4. Today, I would like to speak in strong opposition to the proposed budget increases for both the Halifax Regional Police and the RCMP. I would specifically like to speak to the proposed addition of 12 constables dedicated to hospitals and mental health calls in HRM. According to the HRP's budget proposal, these 12 officers would specifically provide assistance with detaining individuals under Section 14 the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act. Our current mental health system is failing us. As a social worker and community member, I have seen this firsthand. Halifax needs robust community interventions, not more police officers. I have worked with many clients and community members who have been traumatized by police involvement in their mental health calls. Police regularly escalate the crisis after arriving at the scene, and particularly for individuals who are racialized and or transgender, these interventions can lead to severe injury or death. The recent deaths of Regis Korczynski Paquette, Rodney Levi, Danny DC Cooper, Chantel Moore, and others have all occurred 
simply because Canadian police were called to a mental health crisis. Often, when my clients are in distress, they will do anything to avoid calling crisis lines or mobile mental health crisis teams. I have worked with people who have died by suicide because they knew the police-based services available to them in crisis would not support them. The research shows overwhelmingly that, people are that police are likely to be violent towards people with untreated mental illness. Already, too many people have been killed by Canadian police officers responding to wellness checks and mental health calls. This budget increase would result in more officers responding to mental health calls and more individuals being involuntarily detained and hospitalized. It would spike fear in an already marginalized population and in no gentle words, would eventually lead to the deaths of more Nova Scotians. This is in direct conflict with recent research conducted by the HRM, which encourages the city to detask police from mental health calls and invest in civilian-led responses. There are many civilians in this city who are better equipped than the HRP to respond to these calls. We have access to a large population of frontline community workers, healthcare workers, social workers, and peer support workers who care deeply about our community. For many years, people in Halifax have been urging Halifax Regional Council to divert funds from police to initiatives like housing, food security, and civilian-led mental health response. I ask you, when will you start listening? We need to direct these funds to a care-based solution, and we need to do it now. The Halifax Regional Police have made it clear that they do not want to be working with people in a mental health crisis. To quote Chief of Police Don McLean, the HRP would love to be out of the mental health business 100%. Frankly, from talks with my clients and my community, we don't want to be working with police either. The data is clear. Civilian-based solutions work. This money must be used much more effectively to fund civilian-based mental health response teams which do not involve police. The HRP's budget proposal says that this is only a stopgap response until non-police alternatives are established. Yet the costs of this program are expected to double for the 25-26 budget year to $1.5 million. Today, I ask you why the cost of a short-term stopgap solution is expected to double the following year. I find it hard to justify these increases amidst the housing and health care crisis currently happening in our city. Increases to the police budget will surely mean that other essential services face cuts. Already, many of these services do not receive the funding they need to operate sustainably. I desperately urge you to stop for a moment and think about the lives that could be changed with civilian-led crisis response versus the lives that will be lost or destroyed by police response. This is the decision that you have to make today. I beg you to show your empathy with your decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac, for your letter as well. I want to assure people that, uh, you know, there's been some correspondence sent that has been circulated to all councillors, and we've all uh, looked at it and appreciate people taking the time. Uh, Willa, Willa Oaks, Nancy Hunter, any lap. Willa, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Willa Oaks. I live in District 9. Um, I'm here to speak in opposition to the HRP budget increase, and I feel like it's important to note that this is the third time some of us have spoken this budget season, and we have yet to have any evidence that any of our concerns have been heard. In fact, on October 25th and November 22nd, so many members of the public spoke out against the proposed $5.7 million HRP budget increase. In fact, almost 80% of presentations from the public have been in opposition. Despite this, there is no evidence that the Board of Police Commissioners took any of the public's concerns into consideration. In fact, Gavin Giles, Vice Chair of the Board of Police Commissioners, felt so confident in his complete disregard for the public consultation process. He said, quote, to be clear on the record, I have not been attracted by any of the canned and banal presentations of the type we received last week and two weeks before that some of which have been really bizarre. Nonsense and rubbish commentary designed only to titillate and annoy rather than to inform and teach. And yet we're still all here despite the fact that we are insulted by members of your party. <laughs> anyway, a wild statement from someone whose role it is to provide civilian oversight and a statement that went completely unchallenged by the other six commissioners, some of which are in the room with us today, 
Um, anyway, before I start, I'd like to note that the only people I've noticed speak in, in favor of this budget have been literal landlords and cops. So I feel like you're either gonna side with the landlords and the cops or literally everyone else. Um, all right, so before I start, I'd like to make it very clear that I did not design this statement to titillate or annoy. Unlike almost every other service in this city, the police are never asked to do, make do with less. While program providers are rationing food, the food they provide at their youth programs, the police are asking for more money because the cost of ammunition has gone up. If this juxtaposition doesn't make you nauseous, I implore you to examine why you're so much more comfortable funding deadly weapons than food. On that note, City Council announced this week that they can't afford the $856,000 required to implement the HRM food strategy to address food insecurity. And we'll re be reviewing it line by line to see where cuts can be made. I expect you'll be combing the HRP budget with the same magnifying glass. So I thought I'd help you get started by highlighting some areas that I, in which the HRP are blatantly exploiting public funds. One, salaries. It would be senseless to talk about police overspending without talking about salaries. Over 74% of HRP employees make over $100,000 per year, according to the 2022 Municipal Compensation Report. While the average annual income is, while the average annual income is $53,000 and one in five children live in poverty. How can you justify pouring more money into the most expensive and most ineffective way to address societal issues? Two, out of town travel. They've budgeted $380,000 up from $150,000 last year. The people you're tasked to serve and protect are here. What, what is this travel? Is it absolutely necessary? Could it be a Zoom call? And is it more important than food? Three, clothing allowance, a separate category from uniforms to be clear, and it's up 9% from 2023 at $466,000. From some late Googling, which I assume you'll get more into in your um, overview, um, this appears to be an allowance for officers that are asked to perform duties in plain clothes. They get a $600 tax-free allowance to buy plain clothes. I would love to know how the city can justify spending almost half a million dollars for officers to buy clothes. Um, something that everyone else does without uh, funding from their employer. Um, for advertising and promotion, they are looking to increase this spending by 229% this year, up to $20,000. Five, rewarding excellence. They are looking to increase this vague category by 466% this year. Um, all right, I'm at my time, but their list goes on, so I uh, look forward to seeing what your line by line review of this budget looks like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nancy Hunter, Annie Lapp, Ash Hinchy, Nancy Hunter. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Nancy Hunter. I live in District 11. I think I'm not going to go by my notes because I have a lot of the things here that other people have said. So I'm just going to talk to you and uh, see if I can fill in a few other gaps. So I've lived in Halifax all my life. And as a white girl growing up in suburban Halifax, I believe certain things about the purpose of police the function of police, what police did, what they were for. And then I got out of suburban white uh, Halifax and I made my way in the world and met many different people and worked in community and learned that not everyone's experience with police is the same. I learned that police harm many people in our community. I learned that 
even the things we think police do, like investigate crimes when they are brought to them, that they have good policies and procedures and good chains of command and good training, and trainings are mandatory. All of these things I've learned throughout many years aren't so true. And one of the things I've become a little bit expert on is accountability by police, or as I now call it, inaccountability, uh, by systems designed for inaccountability, and a culture that has bestowed on police unquestionability and a kind of morality that the rest of us don't have. So one of the things that came out of the Marshall Inquiry was the Police Board of Commissioners, which is supposed to be a social, which is supposed to be a civilian oversight into policing. It was struck because there was, diplomatically put, a very unhealthy relationship between politicians and uh, politicians and police. And I think what everyone knows, Nova Scotia is really considered still somewhat an old boys network. So we wouldn't be here if the police board of commissioners were doing their job. So I don't know if any of you recognize me, but in the November 22nd meeting, I was one of the first speakers. And I got up and I said things that are many of the things that were said today, many of the things that are in the reports, evidence that we all know, but nothing is being done about it. And I was censored by the police board of commissioners. I was accused by Commissioner Giles of casting aspersions, even though, again, everything I said was evidence-based. And this was upheld by Chair Kent, who censored me two more times. I broke no rules. I said nothing that hasn't been said before. I was given no justification for my censorship. None. I asked questions, nothing. Now, I think everyone here should be very concerned in this democratic institution where public presentations are supposed to be meaningful, that when they get uncomfortable or when we get critical, that this kind of censorship can arise. One of the things about why I think this is, so your job, you are trusting that the Board of Police Commissioners is doing their job so that they're going to bring you, when their work is done, this to present to you. Well, they've presented to you, what they presented to you is pretty much the police ask in its entirety. So maybe we don't need the Police Board of Commissioners at all. Maybe we can just get rid of it and the police can come just directly to you. They are not rigorously crit uh, critically uh, analyzing the police budget. This cop to pop, well, maybe we should look at that. Are there questions around that? Is that a real thing? Um, is there, you know, are there cuts? Are there detasking, retasking? None of the things we are saying did they take into consideration. They just said, yes, rubber stamp, and brought this to you. Quote, uh, Becky Kent. Uh, uh, the increases are needed because of growth in the municipality and police services are stretched thin. Really, it's about the rationale of what the police put forward, none of which is in the report, none of which us, the community, the people out here who are doing the heavy lifting on safety, on caring, on all of these things. We're not on the sunshine list. We are here doing the work and we are dismissed and disparaged and this is a very bad thing for our city. Nancy, before you go, there's yes. a question here from Councillor Blackburn. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, more of a, a clarification more than anything else. Um, I was at the meeting where you were uh, asked to refrain from mentioning a specific case. You were allowed to present and you had your five minutes, uh, but just wanted to make it clear that the reason why we asked you to uh, to refrain from mentioning a specific case is because we cannot discuss specific cases in a public forum like that. So just wanted to clarify for folks who perhaps did not see that meeting that uh, we were more than welcome to, to hear your submission, but what we could not hear was specifics about a specific case. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
No, I don't think so. I think uh, the five minutes is uh, is uh, is that done. Is not that, okay. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, any Lap Ash Hinchy, K McDonald, any Lap, N A. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, Annie couldn't be here because it's uh, 9.30 on a Wednesday or whatever. Um, so I'm going to speak on their behalf. And first of all, I'd just like to say that Nancy was censored for saying that there was rampant racism in the HRP. That is the comment that Giles had issue with. So that just needs to be said. Can you just identify yourself for us and where you're from? Um, my name is Annie Lapp, and I'm a resident of District 8. I'm speaking today because I want City Council to spend to send the police budget back to the Board of Police Commissioners for review so that our municipal tax dollars can be reallocated to social services that keep Haligonians safe and cared for and able to access their city. In this city's supposedly democratic system, part of the budget review process is public consultation. From what I have seen, the public consultation is merely a checked box for the Board of Police Commissioners and the review pro proceeds purely on advice of the police. It takes a lot of bravery and moving through many levels of inaccessibility to participate in this process as a member of the public. In fact, the fact that councillors are permitted to make flagrantly dismissive comments about public contrib contribution is one dimension of inaccessibility of public consultation. I am speaking about, count about Commissioner Giles calling the well-researched evidence and personal experiences shared at the consultation on November 22nd, banal and titillating, which was approved by his fellow councillor's silence. These comments follow a running theme of disrespect for public, evi for public evidence, <coughs> for public comments follow, sorry, for public evidence previously by the board's silence of approval of dehumanizing and disgraceful language used toward our unhoused neighbors at the consultation on October 25th, 2023. Excuse me, uh, Annie, I, th I think you've already spoken. I'm, I'm speaking on Annie's behalf because they're not able to be here today. Thank you. Um, how is someone supposed to feel safe sharing their voice in this quote unquote democratic process when Commissioners themselves are openly disrespectful of it. The Board of Police Commissioners approved the proposed police budget to move ahead without any changes, despite citizens sharing valuable insight and, caref and after carefully outlining evidence and statistics of police harms and ineffectiveness, including the research in the city's own comprehensive and so far ignored police defunding the police report. The fact that the proposed police budget is moving forward without any changes, despite the information at city at council's disposal is honestly astonishing. When I walk to work after a storm like the one we just had, I risk sprains and falls trying to climb through the uncleared snow on the sidewalks. In the event of any amount of snow falling, which we can expect for at least a third of the year, the hard work working people in the snow clearing department can only do so much with the amount of funding they have. When I am navigating uncleared snow piles, piled walked sidewalks, I can't help but think of how many people are simply forced to stay home because of how inaccessible the city has become. Why is it accessible for the city to deny the option for many people to leave their home, potentially for weeks, while sidewalks remain clogged? Meanwhile, when I take the number three bus in the morning, buses pass me because they're too full or admit me only to be sardined with other riders because our transit system is consistently underfunded and buses do not run regularly enough. And as our city's houseless population grows, the city can only cobble together piecemeal and haphazard solutions to keeping these citizens safe in cold or stormy periods, let alone at other times. Rather than acting with the urgency that is needed right now to ensure all Haligonians are able to thrive, not simply survive, I find it bold that the Board of Police Commissioners and the City Council would consider going ahead with approving the proposed police budget when essential services are struggling to serve Haligonians. Basic accessibility for all citizens, basic needs, and basic navigation of our city are being neglected in favor of funding a department that we have made ourselves horse telling you does not keep anyone but white wealth holding citizens safe. 
please review the budget so that our tax dollars are allocated to keeping everyone in the city safe, cared for, rather than to take a, an agency that serves to intimidate and enact violence on our most marginalized neighbors. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Ash Hinchy, uh, Kay McDonald, and then Carmel Farakbash. Ash, welcome. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Hinshi and I'm from District 8 and um, I'm here to read out the open letter that has been referenced a few times um, within today's speakings um, and one that has not been adequately responded to yet up to this date. Uh, the letter itself received 800 signatures from community members, uh, including 82 businesses and organizations such as Adsum, Elizabeth Fry, North and Community Health Center, uh, Coverdale and many others. Um, so to start the letter off, we are a group of HRM residents and organizations who are asking the council uh, reject the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners recommendations to increase the 2024-25 Halifax Regional Budget by 6.3%. Once again, an overwhelming majority of speakers at the BOPC's public consultation advocated against increases to the police budget for detasking police from responding to mental health calls and for the BOPC to be more rigorous in their oversight of Halifax Regional Police. In opposition to this public input, the BOPC has recommended the full budget increase acting against the defunding the police report and the final report of the Mass Casualty Commission and the HRM's own public safety strategy. One of the pillars of the defunding the police report prepared by a subcommittee of the BOPC in 2022 was to improve public consultation processes. Um, the BOPC is in obvious violation of section six of their public manual, which states that the meetings must be accessible to the public. This inaccessibility renders this process and the BOPC's budget recommendation illegitimate. At this year's consultations, there have been many barriers to engagement. Um, one of them is despite requests, there was no ASL interpretation or live captioning, thus making meetings inaccessible to members of the deaf and the hard of hearing community. For those who have been directly traumatized by police and for communities who are most vulnerable to policing, there were no accommodations made for the participation. This includes black, indigenous and people of color, people with mental illness, sex workers, unhoused people, people who use drugs, people who experience gender based violence and 2SLGBTQ plus plus people. This failure to accommodate is in direct contradiction to the recommendations of the public safety strategy. Um, another point is at the virtual consultation on October 25th, stigmatizing language was used to refer to unhoused people. The chair, Becky Kent and commissioners allowed these dehumanizing comments to continue. At the in-person consultation on November 22nd, an early speaker was censored for being critical of the police. I think we just heard about that. Their time was shortened due to the interruptions from the chair and they were not allowed to speak of specific experiences with police. The previous speaker who was in favor of the increase was allowed <laughs> to speak of specific positive experiences with police and was allowed to go over the allotted time. This double standard undermines the legitimacy of public consultation process. Um, and the final point um, in the letter is that the board meeting on November 29th, 29th sorry, Commissioner Gavin Giles made disregard, disparaging remarks in reference to public consultation participants. Uh, specifically, he said, I have not been attracted by any of the canned and banal presentations of the type we received last week and two weeks before that, some of which have been really bizarre, nonsense and rubbish, commentary designed only to titillate and annoy. The BOPC accepted these comments. This demonstrates clear disregard for the public consultation process and the community members. I'd also like to add that he's now not only accepted these comments, he's now the vice chair. Um, given what we have seen in the budget process this year, we are concerned with the legitimacy 
uh, the BOPC's recommendation, we call on the council to enforce the BOPC's principle of public voice inclusion, as it stated in the introduction to the BOPC's policy manual. This should include, uh, this should consist of a what we heard report explaining how public feedback was included in the BOPC's decision. Our city is in crisis with a dire lack of housing, food, and health services to, incre to increase the police budget at this time is constant. Oh, my time is, oh, sorry, I thought I heard somebody. Um, we could do much better. We are urging you to reject the BOPC's recommendation to increase the Halifax Regional Police Budget for 2024-2025. Um, and this was signed again by 800 community members, including 82 businesses and organizations within the community. And I would again like to speak that it is very concerning to me that the people here today speaking against our landlords and union members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and just again, to assure people, we have that letter. Every councillor has it, has read it. I'm, I know that uh, they have. Um, so thank you for that. Kay, Kay McDonald, Carmel uh, Farakbash, Amber Tucker. Good morning. Uh, happy Black History and African Heritage Month. My name is Kay McDonald, but most of you know that already. I was born and raised in the city. More importantly and accurately, I'm from Jabuktuk, Mi'kma'ki, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. I have fallen in love here, grown up here, and the work I do every day here in this city is to try and create a beautiful city for us all to have our wildest dreams and basic needs met. I've been presenting at these budget meetings for what feels like years and years and years, continuously bringing the voice of many communities into this room. Big shout out to those who are here to speak today. Speaking truth to power is a practice that is nerve wracking and vulnerable, and I applaud all of us for showing up. It is once again Black History Month, and it feels counterintuitive to the purpose of this month that I'm spending my time advocating for dire community services. Amid several intersecting crises in the city, which we all know well enough by now, impact those of us relegated to the margins. I'm in firm opposition to the proposed HRP RCMP budget increases for 2024, 2025, and let me tell you why. I'll start with my personal and communal experience dating back to August 18th, 2021, and before deeming this as irrelevant, please hear me out. On August 18th, 2021, I sustained injuries from HRM sanctioned police violence, injuries I will live with for the rest of my life, including a concussion, spinal and hip injuries that I'm still dealing with chronically to this day. The amount of money I've spent on osteopaths, massage therapists, chiropractors, physiotherapists has exceeded my allotted benefit packages and I end up paying out of pocket to treat injuries that were city sanctioned. With a fuller budget, there's only more potential for further irrevocable bodily harm to occur in our city and to my communities. These injuries are important to name, seeing as I was present for less than two and a half minutes on August 18th. Where were the de-escalation tactics? Where was the demonstration of community-centered, care-informed policing? How did I become so violently injured in such a short period of time? What policing strategy was employed here? I was arrested and charged with charges that were ultimately dropped due to lack of evidence. I was arrested and brutalized for what? I was traumatized and violated by HRP for caring for my unhoused neighbors, family members, peers, and friends. <laughs> Is this what we can expect the future of policing to look like? On August 18th, there were multiple members of vulnerable communities who are historically and currently disproportionately targeted by police, such as racialized people, queer and trans folks, and people with mental illness. These community members experienced extreme violence and have sustained multiple injuries. Since the 18th, police have yet to respond with full transparency and accountability about their actions. Among the people impacted, many were youth, which is disturbing to me as a, children, a child and youth worker. This is not the outcome of over, the overused rhetoric, a few bad apples. This is exactly what policing is designed to do and values. In the press conference following these events, Dan Kinsella offered no form of apology or accountability in response to the fact that a 10 year old was pepper sprayed and said that police have to look at the situation in its totality. He stated there are situations where the irritant can atomize and get into the air, depending on the airflow and wind, it can travel a little bit, generally in a less concentrated form. To me, this clearly illustrates a lack of HRP control over a dangerous weapon and controlled substance. In December 2022, CTV published an article titled Experts Warn of the Perfect Storm as the Number of Police Shootings Increase in 2022. In this article, Dr. Uh, Ori Ola, a professor of criminology and associate dean at the University of Alberta, said it's concerning to see the number of fatal encounters with police grow. Several variables contribute to the increase, he said, including inadequate training and an overall reliance on force and lack of accountability. In September 2023, we saw the tragic murder of queer and trans community member Danny Cooper. <clears throat> 
a 27-year-old poet and activist in BC during a wellness check. Very sadly, they advocated for police to be removed from mental health crisis responses during their life. It is clear that this growing epidemic of police violence does not inspire confidence in the system of policing, and especially not in the realities of police supporting mental health. So far in 2024, we've seen four people murdered by the police in Canada. We often look at other provinces and act like these practices or people aren't our business. Policing is the same practice beyond borders and has had the same desired outcome since its inception. Every officer takes the same oath and abides by the same code of conduct to which they are accountable. And as the iconic Gwendolyn Brooks has said, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, and we are each other's magnitude and bond. At what point have we seen HRP demonstrate the necessary skills to deal with folks who are in a mental health crisis? At what point will nationally acclaimed research be sufficient? At what point will community and personal testimony be rendered enough? And when will we be heard? Money is an investment, and I've said it before, where the government puts its money shows us what you care about. What do you care about? Who do you care about? And what are you dream your dreams for the future of this city? I know what mine are, and I work towards them every single day. I scream, and I shout for my dreams, and I show up to budget meetings for my dreams, and never once have my dreams included incarceration, punitive measures, police, station, police state sanctioned violence, and or murder. Stats show us this isn't the way forward. HRP has had a historical and present lack of accountability to community at large surrounding their own policing practices. There has not been any demonstrated trust or care illustrated through policing practices at large in this city. I'm at time and I could go on forever. Thanks. Thank you very much. Carmel followed by Amber Tucker and then Ray Paul. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for getting my last name right. Um, that, that's awesome. Um, I really appreciate being able to speak here today from my personal experience, but also through the lens of community engagement work and nonprofit work. I, sorry. I strongly believe that it is dangerous, irresponsible, and negligent to increase the police budget. Oh, sorry, I actually lost my note. Do you mind if I just find it again? Can I pause my time just for a second? Sorry. Sure thing. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, I found it, thank you so much. <laughs> On January 31st, a new report was released from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives that states Nova Scotia child poverty rates rose above 20.5% 20 in 2021, which represents approximately 35,000 children in youth. This jump in Nova Scotia's child poverty rate represents the biggest single year increase since 1989. While this data is collected for the entire province, it is critical to look at the ways this impacts the municipality. In the youth-based nonprofit I direct, we have seen a huge increase in housing and food insecurity, so much so that we have taken our limited funding options to stretch programs into creating more food-oriented programs, as well as piloting a housing support worker. We have catalyzed this work because we see our municipality in an acute crisis. We have also done this work without an increase to our core funding model since 2018, what most social services have to do uh, in this current context. As my passion is in youth work, I'm going to now focus on the overcriminalization of marginalized youth and the overcriminalization of poverty that we see demonstrated through local and national data. In 2022, a, titled, a study titled Black Youth and the Criminal Justice System, we see first voice storytelling show us across sites. Participants have identified schools as key sites where black youth have their first contact with the criminal justice system and the police. This connection is well documented and often referred to the school to prison pipeline. The other most commonly mentioned pathway stems from anti-black racism in neighborhood policing. In this study, a parent in Halifax shared Kids 13 and 14 years old were coming home from the park. They walked on the lawn of a building, they were playing. Building occupants got nervous and they thought they were trying to break in. Police came with guns uh, and said they were arresting them for home invasion. A father who also is a service provider in Halifax said, the moments our kids are born, we have to think about how to answer to the police, how to keep their hands in plain sight. And you police wonder why we get so upset when you handle the kids the wrong way. He's already a criminal before he is born. These experiences are validated by a 2023 study, I feel I was targeted. A quote from the study reads, most people we spoke to had their first encounters with police officers at a young age, some early as 12 or 13. The youth consistently felt that they were perceived as criminals. In the 2022 Stat Can study titled, Perceptions and Experiences with Police Among Black and Indigenous Populations, 
Author Adam Cotter states, experiences of discrimination have been subject of discussion nationally for decades. Over time, the rise of movements seeking racial and social equity in response to current injustices have demonstrated the importance of measuring and monitoring outcomes of policing. A 2021 study titled To Serve and Protect Whom discusses how despite the creation of numerous anti-racism committees to address police concerns and public concerns to policing, ongoing evidence suggests that black and indigenous youth continue to be at risk of harm in the presence of police, especially while in mental distress. In the 2022 study, The Impact of Police Violence in Toronto, authors discuss police violence as a Canadian public health issue. Every participant reported long histories of police contact beginning in early adolescence. All participants reported witnessing police violence, all participants, and 89% report, reported direct experiences of police violence themselves. Police describe, participants described police encounters starting in early teenage years while also expressing immense fear reporting this violence. According to the Youth Criminal Justice Act and the United Nations Conventions on the Right of the Child, children and youth should never experience this level of sanctioned violence. In all of these studies, we see systemic fail failure. We see our youth populations being criminalized based on their identities, where they live, as well as a lack of social supports for getting their needs met. And we still do not see an active investment in social services and community-based supports. In 2021, we see another call for detasking and reform from a House of Commons report titled Systemic Racism in Policing in Canada. Here, like many reports and research before, they give a list of recommendations. In this HOC report, the Honourable Justice Michael Basterash discusses policing culture in Canada as toxic. Some recommendations are higher civilian review, investigations, oversight, feedback at large, recognizing that decisions surrounding policing must be community driven and a structural and cu cultural modernization of policing and the use of indigenous knowledge systems and frameworks in this change. I urge council to reflect on these recommendations as well as the recommendations made in our own extensive 2022 defending report, recommendations from the TRC, Recommendations from the Toronto-based report, Rethinking Community Safety. Reading experiences from the Wortley Port, and I could go on and on. There is so much data, research, and for first voice storytelling that supports the voices of so many here. Through these contexts, recent histories, and ongoing realities, I encourage meaningful, tangible, and just responses to the proposal for the HRP increase. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Amber Tucker, Ray Paul, Caitlin O'Neill. Amber Tucker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amber. I live in District 7. Today, I want to speak against the proposed HRP budget increase. Not only do I believe that this increase of almost $6 million would be better spent funding the social services and programs that support everyone to be safe and well, I also see a lack of evidence that dedicating even more resources to policing accomplishes the stated purpose of making our communities safer. In the report, Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM, released in January 2022, the authors write that police use of force killed 555 people in so-called Canada between 2000 and June 2020, citing the CBC Deadly Force database. Since June 2020, according to the Tracking Injustice Project, that number of deaths has already climbed from 555 to 757, which means since June 2020, more than 200 people in this country have been killed by police using force. In short, police are killing more people at a faster rate, statistically. These numbers do not even include many cases, including in-custody deaths, deaths resulting from suicide when police were present, or accidental police-caused deaths such as a traffic accident. And who is losing their lives to police? Disproportionately, it is Indigenous and Black people. Indigenous people account for 4.2% of the national population, but they make up 16% of the deaths at the hands of police. And Black people account for 2.9% of the population, but 8.6% of those killed by police. I don't think that the horrifying uh, injustice of this reality can be communicated in statistics, um, but here's one more. 68% of the people killed in police encounters were experiencing mental illness, addiction, or both. Because police didn't value their lives enough to not kill them, which I think is a low, low bar, these people who needed care and support have become statistics. 
From my own experience, when people I love have been taken into custody while they were struggling with substance use and mental health issues, these were some of the most acutely terrifying times of my life because I know that many others in that situation have died in custody. Recommendations from the defunding parole report include that the police board should conduct research and consultation with stakeholders to examine opportunities for disarming certain groups of officers and for minimizing the use of firearms by police. It was also recommended that the police board must provide meaningful oversight and transparency regarding the HRP and RCMP's use of special weapons teams, long guns, riot gear, and other militarized equipment. It is unclear if there has been any movement toward these recommendations. So if this cannot even be done, I honestly have no faith in the ability of the policing system to provide help for mental illness, street patrols, or hospitals in a responsible and nonviolent manner. Related to the past few decades of dismantling of the social safety net in favor of things such as more policing, unhoused people as well as physically or intellectually disabled people are also at a higher risk of becoming unhoused, which makes them far more vulnerable to police violence simply for trying to exist. We all saw on August 18th, 2021, as Kay was just speaking about how unhoused people in Halifax were brutally attacked by police as were their allies for trying to preserve the tiny shelters and these folks who were also harmed by HRP's violent actions that day are disproportionately members of the LGBTQ2SIA plus community. So when we say we need more police to make communities more safe, we should be asking whose communities? And how is HRP doing the deep and reparative work that is desperately needed to ensure this violence does not continue? Yes, landlords and business owners want more policing, which they see as ensuring safety. And of course, these are the people that see themselves as being served by this budget increase. I see this as the logic of class war. If the city keeps throwing more police at problems based in poverty and inequality, then it's going to have to keep on throwing more and more police at the problem because policing doesn't heal these problems. The use of force and intimidation doesn't heal these problems. The people who are being over-policed are, by and large, not the threat to public safety, rather judging some humans to be expendable and acceptable victims of police violence is a threat to us all. Uh, I just want to end by saying why should HRP be handed even more money when they show so little accountability for their actions and when there could be so many other programs that many people have described before me with great expertise and compassion. Uh, approving this budget increase would be unjust and undemocratic and the Halifax 2024 20, budget must do better than this. I ask you to invest in people, not in policing. Thank you very much. Uh, Ray Paul, Caitlin O'Neill and then Laurie Curtis. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm here representing the Youth Project. I'm a resident of District 3. Uh, my name is Ray. I am a 2S LGBTQIA housing coordinator for the Youth Project. The Youth Project is a nonprofit organization serving 2S LGBTQIA youth in the province of Nova Scotia within Mi'kma'ki. Our mandate is to make the lives of queer and trans young people safer, happier, and healthier through youth programming, classroom outreach, and education, and support services including peer-to-peer -peer counseling, housing support, and access to name and gender marker change processes. With the interests of incredible young people as our top priority, we are in adamant disagreement and disapproval of the proposed budget increase of the Halifax Police Department, HRP. To be clear, we are advising that Council reject the Halifax Board of Police Commissioners' recommendation to increase the 2024-25 Halifax Regional Police Budget by $5,787,100, 6.3%, uh, this is an increase that is five times that of the Youth Project budget. We are echoing calls to defund the police and invest in social services that enable Nova Scotians to access a basic quality of life, namely access to food and housing and we encourage you to imagine what would be possible if these funds were instead invested in such services. In case you were not aware, although people have talked about this today, we would like to remind you that in 2022, Feed Nova Scotia reported that 22% of Nova Scotians live in food insecure households, 
and are unable to meet their basic food and nutrition needs. This percentage increases for racialized families with black Nova Scotian families at 39.2% and indigenous Nova Scotian families at 33.4%. These statistics hold that one in three black and indigenous families in Nova Scotia are food insecure and we ask how will more cops feed Nova Scotians? There is a substitute teacher crisis in Nova Scotia, but there are cops in schools. There has been no publicly available report on the effectiveness of school safety resource officers, SROs, in Nova Scotia, but similar reports in other provinces have found the program ineffective at increasing school safety and have found the presence of police on school grounds to target students of color, leading to increased surveillance and criminalization after school hours and into their adult lives. Why does our public funding public money fund the alienation of young people in what is meant to be a learning environment, while school staff who specialize in supporting some vulnerable students are being pulled away from this critical work to fill in where a substitute teacher cannot be found. We ask, how do COPS ensure all of our students are being taught at standards that reflect the inclusive education policy and the standards of teaching? And what kind of training do school-based police officers undergo to implement such policies and standards in our schools? Our schools need more teachers and supports, uh, support workers, not COPS. We have a highly skilled team of 2S LGBTQIA plus community members who are employed at the Youth Project. We as a collective prioritize care centering youth voice and survivor expertise as foundations to organizational decision making. In conversations with incredible youth that we work with, they have asked that involving the police be taken out of our safer space policy, asking that police presence in an emergency response only be used if all other options were exhausted. Eliminating the police was the safest option for 2S LGBTQIA plus youth, many of whom are also members of the BIPOC community. When asked about why this was important in consultations with our executive director, youth gave and continue to give such insightful and brilliant responses such as, I get scared when I see a police officer in uniform. I have had terrible experiences with the police before. I, do, I know that they are not safe for me and I don't want my mental health experience to lead to punishment. Many older youth participants continue to speak out about the harms of policing and the overrepresentation of harm in relation to queer, BIPOC, and disabled youth. We have borne witness to stories of violence, harassment, discrimination perpetuated by police against youth community members and firmly believe an increase in criminalization, surveillance, and policing will not bolster community resilience. In fact, many youth who access our services and staff were harmed at the hands of HRPD on August 18th and still have recurrent trauma and injuries. In a recent report, The Color of Violence, Race, Gender and Anti-Violence Services, survivors of color reported that police were the least helpful form of support, instead highlighting family and friends as the most supportive. In a city that is a microcosm of a national housing crisis, an opioid and toxic drug poisoning epidemic, and a gender-based violence epidemic, we desperately need healing. Cops don't provide community care, people do. Please consider investing in community care, not more cops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Caitlin O'Neill, and then uh, virtually with Laurie Curtis, and then Brody Weaver. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, um, yeah, who, who is that? Caitlin O'Neill. Oh, you're coming, okay, all right. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. The floor yeah. is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. So my name is Caitlin O'Neill. I'm in Lindell Smith's district. I'm here today to speak as a healthcare worker and to echo the sentiments that have already been said regarding investing more in community care. Uh, as a healthcare worker, I strongly believe in evidence-based practice. And as a citizen, I believe that city council has a responsibility to use our budget responsibly and use evidence-based practices. And the fact of the matter is that increasing police budgets is not an evidence-based practice for making communities safer. What are evidence-based practices are reducing poverty, reducing loneliness, and improving the supports that people have in their lives. These interventions also are shown to improve healthcare outcomes. And as everyone here is aware, we are in the middle of a healthcare crisis and every level of government in Nova Scotia should be doing what's within their mandate to alleviate that crisis. And poverty and loneliness are two of the biggest drivers of healthcare issues that are addressed, able to be addressed by all levels of government. 
So I believe that city council should be investing in measures that alleviate poverty and improve access to food and housing and social services and social supports and enjoyment that are you know, extremely important for supporting community members' health and well-being. That's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Our next speaker is Lori Curtis. Is that a Zoom as well? Uh, uh, yes, Mayor Savage. Okay, we'll see if we can make it Hi. Lori. Uh, good Lori, morning. Good morning. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lori Curtis. I'm um, a resident of Dartmouth um, in district in um, Sam Austin's district. I don't know which district it is. Um, so I'm the reason I'm speaking today is to request that the Halifax Council does not approve the 2024-2025 HRP RCMP budget and business plan as proposed. Um, I didn't speak at the um, Halifax Board of Police Commissioners meetings for public engagement, but I was able to watch um, the recordings and read um, some of the news articles about them. And to be honest, I was a bit shocked how the Board of Police Commissioners dismissed members of the public. And that's actually why um, I registered to speak here because um, I feel that we're, we're on a path of, of um, dismissing the public when they're trying to voice their opinions, and I hope that we don't continue down this path um, as we go forward now um, that it's before Halifax Council. Um, I also just want to take the opportunity to thank those community members who have um, continued to speak at the, whether it's the Halifax Council meetings or the Board of um, Commissioner meetings, just because um, this isn't easy. I don't enjoy um, speaking. In public, I don't enjoy coming in this and taking time out of my work day, and it's stressful. And so I do want to thank all of you who have spoken before me, um, who've come with the information and the research and are tireless, tirelessly advocating for a better community in forums like these. Um, just as a resident of Dartmouth, as a parent, as a community member, I just want to say I appreciate and value all of you and what you've been doing. Um, I, I'm just speaking as a member of the public. Um, I want to live in a city, a municipality, where the council works with community members on a vision of, of what they want the city to look like, how they want to improve the well-being of residents with the priority given to the most vulnerable um, in our communities, and, and working step by step to achieving that. Of course, I, I recognize the unique circumstances right now of increasing costs everywhere, but I am very tired and frustrated of seeing that priority is constantly given to support those onerous cost burdens to organizations that are already well funded um, instead of those people and organizations for whom, as um, previous speakers have said, smaller amounts of money will be much, much better spent and have a much larger impact on um, community well-being. Um, I, I just want to see that the council uh, today shows that they, you know, want that money to be spent on relieving the burdens on its residents to try and, you know, just that we're all trying to maintain the sort of basic minimum standards. And I don't think that 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 um, a, an increase in the police budget is going to achieve that. Um, I don't fault the HRP and RCMP for asking for more money. I mean, we're all, you know, facing increased costs. But um, I, I do fault the Board of Police Commissioners for accepting it. And also, I'm, I'm very disappointed when we have seen this momentum for defunding the police in, you know, across North America. Um, we recognize that policing doesn't actually make um, safer communities. And while we are supposed to be working for decreasing the budget of police, I, I'm kind of surprised that we're sitting here asking for an increase in the budget, um, especially when there was so much work um, and well thought out research into that went into that 2022 report for defunding the police. And it doesn't appear that any of those recommendations have been taken into account, um, explored or moved forward. So. I guess I'm a bit frustrated that not only are it does it appear that that the city is um, ignoring the goal of working towards investing in community by taking funds of the police and putting them into much needed community service, but 
now even to be asking for an increase, um, it just really, to me, demonstrates the actions of a city that doesn't really acknowledge the problems associated with policing, um, that's not investing in the most vulnerable, and really that isn't looking to see that in the future we're going to be increasingly facing problems because we're not really exploring and implementing the correct solutions for the challenges that um, this city faces. I think we have a really great community here, but um, more needs to be done to support the people and organizations that are really working to support and build community, and that's not the police. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next three speakers are Brody Weaver, Campbell McClintock, Sean McGilvery, and then I'll go back and see if there are people who were on the list that uh, didn't get to speak and would give them an opportunity. Brody Weaver. Welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor Mike Savage and City Councilors 1 through 16. My name is Brody Weaver. I am an educator, youth worker, and resident of District 8. I am here today to advise you all to reject the Halifax Board of Police Commissioner's recommendation to increase the 2024-2025 Halifax Regional Police budget by around $6 million which would affect a 6.3 increase in the already massive operational budget of the HRP. Echoing calls to defund the police and invest in much needed social services that allow us to access a basic quality of life, such as food and housing. I'm here to speak about my personal experiences with the police in Halifax to supplement other speeches against the proposed budget increase. On August 18th, 2021, I was physically assaulted by HRP officers. This assault, which is documented via police cameras, resulted in enduring traumatic brain injury and post-concussive syndrome. My presence at the removal of shelters for unhoused people, much like the ones directly outside of this building, resulted not only in my assault, but in my arrest. I was charged with obstruction of police this charge was later dropped due to a lack of evidence. But after 18 months of punishment by process and thousands of public dollars wasted. So alongside countless others, I will never feel safe in the presence of police again. As I'm sure you are all aware, August 18th, 2021 was a deplorable moment in the history of policing in Nova Scotia. The amount of police violence the public experienced and witnessed is not to be forgotten anytime soon. <coughs> Paramedics treated 21 people with injuries on the scene, all of these from the hands of police. Councillor of District 3, Becky Kent, described what happened that day as, in her own words, violent and disturbing. With regards to the independent review currently investigating police actions on this day, when asked what she hoped this independent review would achieve, she said, there's clearly trust to be repaired. If you meant these words, I must question how giving the HRP more money will result in a different outcome. This money would be much better spent on the root issue of that day, access to housing, reject the increase. In attending the trials of others whose charges were not dropped, I listened as Staff Sergeant Monye Shediak attempted to justify the use of excessive force by stating that he was scared of his own firearm. He was afraid of the crowd on scene that day that they would take his gun. And he said this is why he acted so drastically. I'll let us all think about that for a couple of seconds. At this trial, I also listened as another testifying officer stated that the number of people arrested that day that were being booked at the HRP headquarters was the most she had ever seen in her life and that the facility was not prepared to process this many people. She reasoned that this is why basic rights were not met, including explaining the reason for arrest, reading those in police custody their rights, and providing those in police custody with a lawyer phone call physically assaulting and processing 
dozens of people whose charges would later be dropped as baseless is an inconscionable use of public funds and the proposed budget increase must be rejected. I implore you all to take a stand against the alarming lack of accountability and militarization of the HRP through rejecting this increase and moving towards efforts to rechannel funds into community services. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Campbell McClintock and Sean McGilvery. Welcome. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Campbell. I live in District 8, and uh, I biked in the snow from my house this morning to find at City Hall city workers zip tying uh, notices of eviction to the tents that are 100 feet from us. Um, I worked in supported housing organization for a supported housing organization for three and a half years, where I had frequent interactions with police and encampments, and at shelters. And I'm here today to advise council to reject the proposed HRP budget increase. There are far more effective preventative measures to invest in public well-being, such as food security, public transportation, libraries, warming centers, and of course housing, if city councillors are just willing to be a little bit imaginative. I'm particularly concerned with the increase specifically intended for mental health response. There are cities across the country, such as Toronto and Vancouver, that have implemented police officers specifically for mental health response, only for evidence-based research to reveal that having police respond to mental health escalations disproportionately increases the risk risk of death or injury of the exact community members that police are supposed to be helping. I'm concerned that the city is willing to use public funds to support the possibility of injury or death of my neighbors whenever they have a mental health crisis. I'm worried that this risk of harm or death may continue to disproportionately affect black and indigenous community members. The people that the police identify as criminals are exactly those individuals who are being failed and killed by our society daily. These so-called criminals have never been a threat to me and never will be because I know how to talk to people and listen to people without pulling out a gun. These are real people who deserve the opportunity to thrive and not just become a statistic. The city is more and more impossible to afford to survive in every day and using our tax money to pay for more police is not going to help put a roof over people's heads. There's no amount of trauma informed training that police could receive that would make it safe for somebody with a badge and a gun to respond to a mental health crisis. If the police are struggling to continue responding to mental health crises, it's probably because they are not an adequate solution to this problem and that mental health response should be redirected to harm reduction based service providers. While I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in this public consultation, I worry that this meeting is merely a charade where council members can pretend that they're listening to us while they've already made their decision to fulfill this unsubstantiated budget request rather than fund real public safety and community care. I hope that council has taken time to research this issue enough to know that there's no logical basis for this proposed budget increase. I hope that council is as diligent in deconstructing each line item of this budget proposal as they were for the proposed food security plan yesterday. I hope that council thinks of all the lives of the people who are struggling to survive and are facing state violence every day and not just the landlords and police union reps. If council votes in favor of this increase, the public can only assume that they have not done their research or that they are content to ignore and supersede public safety and consultation in favor of more six-figure salaries for police. I'm open to being proved otherwise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sean McGilvery. Welcome. Thank you, Chair and Council. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the various other ways in which public funds could be spent. Uh, I think that's been covered in a lot of detail. I am going to echo some of the grave concerns that have been raised by other speakers about the integrity and performance uh, and mandate fulfillment of the Board of Police Commissioners. As you may be aware, BOPCs are sort of a creation of the Provincial Police Act. Uh, and so I'm going to read you a few bullet points from the act pertaining to the BOPC's mandate. Ensure the community needs and values are reflected in policing priorities, objectives, goals, programs, and strategies. <laughs> Ensure that police services are delivered in a manner consistent with community values, needs, and expectations. Act as a conduit between the community and police service providers. 
So in light of the remarks made by Vice Chair Giles in response to citizens who have brought their concerns in good faith to the Board of Police Commissioners in the hopes that they will be heard, uh, in light of at least allegations of censorious <coughs> actions on the part of, of the chair and others on that board, I, I feel like I have to recommend that you refuse their HRP budget increase ask. Uh, and again, not, not to belabor the things that other folks have said about but the, uh, whether the spend is appropriate, whether it's fiscally responsible, whether it's effective. Uh, you know, they're like the. I've watched a lot of these meetings now. I've watched a lot of these BOPC meetings, and I, I sit on a few boards myself. I sit on um, the Nova Scotia Health Coalition Board of Directors, for example. Uh, and and what I feel like I see happening is that the BOPC functions as if it is the board of directors of HRP, which is not really, you know, a fulsome description of its mandate. Uh, there's lots of functional overlap, I would I would argue, but. Uh, there are uh, responsibilities above and beyond uh, merely, you know, greasing the wheels and keeping the lights on, uh, so to speak, that I, I feel like there's a clear pattern on the part of the Board of Police Commissioners uh, that there is a lack of will or lack of ability to fulfill. Um, in fact, the recommendation they've come to you with is so out of step both with public opinion, with the research and scholarship that's been done on the topic, and even from the, the other police chiefs themselves. Like we've heard from, you know, from previous speakers who've quoted various chiefs of police saying they don't want to be in the business of, of dealing with people in, in mental health crisis. They're, they're, and it's not an, an HR problem. It's not a, it's not a resources problem. It's that they're not, you know, the police have become this blunt instrument that we use to solve problems that are better solved with other tools. And so we need to be thinking about those other tools. And I think a lot of the speakers who spoke today have, I'm just checking my time here, have, have covered that in great detail. Uh, in fact, I actually just went to a meeting last night of um, Halifax Search and Rescue uh, and met some of those incredible uh, motivated and organized folks uh, who work tirelessly. Uh, and, you would, and you'd be shocked at some of the, some of the things uh, that they take responsibility for and, and, and the, the depth to which they take that responsibility. And so for, for me, that brought home uh, that there are other ways we can deal with people in mental health crisis uh, and, and people who want to do that work. Like the cops don't want to do it. They've said that. Uh, so, so that leaves me thinking, you know, if the, if the cops don't want to do this work and the community doesn't want them doing the work and the scholarship says they ought not to be doing the work, who does want that? And as we heard, from the landlords associate, I guess I have my answer now. I guess I guess I know who is invested in that. Is the people who are directly profiting from the needless suffering that we are witnessing on the front lawn of City Hall today? And I'm sorry to say that closing those camps will not change that. That's the. I'm going to yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to people who uh, were on the list but hadn't spoken. Uh, the first one was. Eloise uh, Brunet, or Eloise Brunet, perhaps, is she, is Eloise here? Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Eloise Brunet Valade. I'm a constituent of District 5. I'm a child care worker, an educational program assistant, and hopefully soon to become an elementary school teacher. Um, I have never personally felt safe around the police. I do not want to see an increase in policing in my community. That is deeply not what I want, and I know that many of us do not want that. I long to be an active participant in a healthy and thriving community. Um, the police doesn't create that healthier community. You know, they actively harm them and harm us over and over and over again. Social and public care makes for healthier communities, support for people to get their basic needs met. Uh, I urge you to deeply question and analyze the narrative that more policing creates safer communities when clearly studies and numbers show us otherwise. I urge you to refuse the increase in budget Thank you for your time. Thank you, Merci. 
Um, Collins Ellison, here now. Good morning. District 7. Uh, sorry. I'm going to wait for uh, whatever it is that I have to be projected. If you would, wouldn't mind restarting the time, I have something there. I have a lot more for the board, but I'll hope to distribute that afterwards. I'll note that we have received some uh, correspondence from you that we all have and have looked at. Yeah, so for uh, viewers at home, uh, sorry, do you mind sliding that up a little bit? Yeah, okay. So there, the 2022 point in time count suggested that uh, out of 586 people who were experiencing homelessness uh, during that point in time count, 85 persons were considered housed within the Burnside Correctional Facility, and that's uh, about 15%. So I'm just saying this is to suggest that there's a, uh, a huge correlation between persons experiencing homelessness and uh, the criminalization and incarceration of those persons as well. Uh, now, if you wouldn't mind, next, uh, next form here. This is the 2021-22 Corrections Key Indicator Report. Uh, it suggested that uh, about 15% of persons uh, incarcerated were of African Nova Scotian descent. I want, to keep, uh, want you to keep that number in mind. Uh, that number, again, is like about 15 for persons of Indigenous descent as well. And the average daily cost of incarceration was $393 per day that equals out to uh, over $140,000 per year. Uh, and uh, again, the expenditure was about 20% of the Department of Justice's budget. Uh, and, and again, the, the next year, uh, the costs or the expenditures it increased by about $8 million. Uh, now, you don't have these figures here. I, I wish I could have had more slides to present, but um, next I'm going, to, I'm going to be looking at the income assistance rates for Nova Scotia. Uh, this is all available on novascotia.ca's website as well. Uh, so for a person who's considered unhoused uh, in Nova Scotia, their income assistance rate is $380 per month, and that equals out to less than 5000 per year. Again, comparing the cost of incarceration, that being over uh, 100000 easily year over year, uh, to spend less than 5000 on a person who is experiencing homelessness is uh, an outrage, I believe. Uh, next, I'm going to be looking at uh, what I believe are some uh, housing affordability uh, numbers. And the CMHC report uh, from 2023 found that uh, average rent <laughs> in Halifax was about 1700 uh, Again, that's, that's substantially more than the income assistance rate for a person who's unhoused. I, I don't think it's a, a debate to anyone that uh, uh, there's a housing crisis in Halifax. And I, I, I'm just using these figures as to, to suggest, again, that um, trying to police our way out of a housing crisis will never work. It, it hasn't, and it, it, it will never work. Uh, next, I'm going to be referring again to the same 2022 point in time count that found 22% uh, of persons who were experiencing homelessness at, at that uh, time were of Indigenous descent and 15% uh, uh, were of uh, African Nova Scotian descent. So again, the, um, the demographics for persons experiencing incarceration are uh, very similar, I would suggest, to the persons who are experiencing homelessness. Again, 15% uh, of which were persons of African Nova Scotian descent, and the number is even higher for persons of Indigenous descent. And uh, keeping this in mind, I understand this is a municipal issue, but the 53% uh, of those persons who are experiencing homelessness were dependent on provincial benefits. So um, again, like more needs to be invested into um, addressing the, the key causes of homelessness, which of course is just housing supply. I, I, would, I would suggest that the province should invest more into uh, public housing uh, as opposed to uh, incarceration, but it also is relevant to the police budget as well because again, uh, to my understanding, police do not collect uh, demographic info f for persons who they interact with. I know that uh, uh, one of the latest, uh, I believe, uh, 
Ryan, Brian reports or something of that sort, uh, the police were supposed to collect race-based data, although they should also collect their inter, uh, like, uh, demographic information on when they're interacting with persons who are experiencing homelessness, as, as I believe, again, it will uh, likely indicate that a lot of those interactions or service calls are directed towards people either experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, and uh, just to uh, give more of an updated figure on those uh, rates of homelessness, the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia, which is the main uh, community organization working with the uh, uh, Reaching Home, that's Canada's national homelessness strategy, they put out uh, weekly by name list statistics. And uh, again, their statistics reflect again that uh, persons of African descent are about 14, 15% of people who are experiencing homelessness and uh, persons of indigenous descent or about 22%. And uh, at last, I wanna suggest that uh, in terms of racial discrimination, the HRP needs to have a division that is uh, centered around equity and diversity. And right now there's no one within that division that's of African Nova Scotian or Mi'kmaq descent. Uh, I, I, I'm, I know I'm at time, but I just want to say this last thing anecdotally. I called uh, HRP and request to speak with an officer of African Nova Scotian descent. Uh, it was only through that means that I found that there's a, a Madeline Smith is the only equity and diversity officer working for the HRP. Uh, and again, I, I felt that I was being discriminated against based on the color of my skin. And I requested to speak again with an officer of African Nova Scotian descent. This was on February 3rd. And on February 4th, I got a call from the HRP uh, from an officer who identified himself as Officer Kuhn. That's spelled K-U-H-N, but obviously pronouncing it Kuhn as in a, a racial uh, discrimination. Uh, and I, I would suggest again that uh, by whatever means, uh, when the HRP are looking into uh, systemic racism within the force, they need to have supervisors as well that can uh, look at some of these complaints on, on a cultural sensitivity basis because um, even of the 12 complaints reviewed uh, w within the previous years out of 120, uh, all of them were uh, basically denied as being uh, uh, some sort of form of racial discrimination by the supervisors. And I would suspect that those supervisors are not uh, culturally competent or from uh, the persons who had, uh, or, or identify with the cultures of the persons who submitted those complaints. So uh, yeah, quite a bit I think the board should consider. Uh, uh, most definitely, again, um, in terms of racial discrimination, I think I've made it very clear that uh, persons who are over-policed are well represented within the African Nova Scotian and indigenous communities. And I, I would suggest that rather than investing in police who have, again, yeah. systemically discriminated against these communities, we should invest more into the types of services which uh, would better serve, again, these, these thank particular... You, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Collins. There's one of the name of somebody who wished to speak but wasn't here when I mentioned the name, and that was Madison Geldert. Madison's not here. So those are the people who've signed up to speak. Is there anybody else who hasn't spoken who would like to speak uh, at this budget? Come ahead. You just identify yourself, where you're from, and the floor is yours. I will, thank you. My name is Jason Snow. I am the Vice President of the Halifax Regional Police Association. Currently with me in the gallery is Sergeant Phil Power. He's our treasurer. I am a resident of District 12, and I live in Timberley. Thank you for the opportunity for having us to speak here. Um, I hope all of you have had the chance to read the letter that Sergeant Darla Perry, our president, had sent to the council and the Board of Police Commission on December 19th. I'm going to be talking about some of the points from that letter. So we support Chief McLean and the management team's budget and the priorities he has outlined for HRP for the upcoming 24-25 budget. But we feel it falls short of what is required to adequately provide the service and the safety to our citizens of HRM. Policing has become more advanced and the time required on calls has increased. Halifax has experienced a rapid population growth and a rise in violent crime severity index. You work for the cops, you shouldn't be speaking. Excuse me, excuse me. Everybody has had a chance to speak. Everybody has an opportunity to speak at the budget. Go ahead. As an example, in 1994, the former city of Dartmouth had 10 officers per shift policing. Okay, thank you.
Go ahead. Thank you. So to get back to it, in 1994, at that time, the former city of Dartmouth had 10 officers policing each shift. Now in 2024, we have an average of 10 to 13 officers policing this same area. In Bedford, we have an in increase expected of about 2,000 plus homes in the area. We currently are still policing Bedford, the former town of Bedford, with 33% of the police complement afforded in 1996. The theme I'm speaking here to is to say we have an increase in population, but our frontline resources are not increasing to match that. Minimum staffing levels are common in our frontline policing. As of December 23, our overtime has been more than 1.5 million to provide minimal staffing on the front lines for our officers on our streets in our three divisions. Also, our prisoner care facility. This is our facility at headquarters where our prisoners need to stay, depending on what their matters are. We've spent approximately 750,000 in overtime costs. And lastly, our integrated emergency service. So this is where if you call, you need services, and you call 911 or the non-emergency, this is where your calls will be answered. We have spent approximately 700,000 in overtime since October 2023 to answer calls of service from all citizens of HRM. Instead of using $3 million in overtime, we hope that we should be hiring full-time police personnel in our organization. The citizens of HRM deserve a fulsome, qualified police presence that can only be provided when we staff accordingly. Minimum expectations that you have need minimum staffing, and this requires human resources to be able to be here to give this to you. As noted, many of our members are off on some form of work. This could be WCB, LTD, paternity leave, sick. Many need additional assistance to come back to the workplace, while our others that are here are still being overworked and burnt out. All of these overtime hours I've mentioned constitute missed opportunity for rest, wellness, and life balance. The cost of this practice is often realized years later when these members start to potentially suffer. We're concerned that we're heading in a dangerous direction. In addressing the sworn officer needs, we feel 24 additional patrol officers today would allow for a reasonable number of resources to alleviate most of the overtime concerns being experienced right now by the HRP, and also to keep coverage at an acceptable level for our citizens. HRP needs to be held accountable for adequate staff to provide quality service. Council is a conduit to holding HRP accountable. Budget oversight and management is critical. Compounding this issue is we currently are operating with approximately 22 vacancies. In regards to staffing, we don't have access to any current uh, cadets at the APA over in Prince Edward Island. We also will not see a graduating class until the spring of 2025. Our ability to attract and retain experienced police officers has been diminished and we anticipate seven upcoming retirements in, the com in this coming year. When we don't staff patrol, we can't provide the proper amount of police personnel for some of our other units and sections, such as our criminal investigation division, which have vacancies as well. I'll just circle back to IES. We find them, the staff there find themselves being asked to work on overtime on a very routine basis, and this has a negative impact. We feel new schedules and additional full-time staff would allow for the attraction and augmentation of the watches. An additional 12 full-time positions could potentially be recruited and funded from our part-time budget. Also, our prisoner care facility costs are driven by supervisor needs that are not funded in the budget. Develop development of prisoner care supervisors could help alleviate these costs. So in closing, I want to express our sincere appreciation for that work that all of our police personnel provide to the citizens of HRM. We are in challenging times and our citizens and our members need more than a band-aid approach to fix the understaffing of HRP. By supporting this budget, the council, the citizens, as well as the police service will know that you support them. Thank you for your time. Just before you go, Councillor Outfit, on a clarification. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, there was a mass exodus when you spoke, so I, I didn't quite hear your, uh, your comments. I think that's unfortunate, because I think everybody deserves to be heard. Um, you mentioned Bedford and patrolling, which is it's not new uh, to me. I, it's something I've been dealing with with several chiefs and, and divisional commanders, and I thought after some last fairly recent hirings that things were getting a little better. Uh, but you made some comments about staffing in Bedford, which I have made in the past. So could you give me the latest update, please? And I'll ask the chief for the same thing later when he speaks. So. What we were referencing was to say that the policing model back in 1996 before amalgamation 
we were currently with 33% of the complement afforded to the area at that time. So essentially, a third of what's there for the okay. old town of Bedford District. Right. Okay. All right. And West I, Division, as you know, has grown exponentially. Oh, absolutely. And, and that there's a whole neighborhoods and communities that didn't exist. That, absolutely. That do. All right. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you for coming in. Um, in relation to the need for what you believe is more bodies, is there? Do you see a correlation though between? the cadet classes and the recruitment and retention efforts that are going on now to bring those bring bodies into some positions now that are you know there are members who you've spoke to it uh, who are off and we need to have have members in those positions can you see that that is is a is a positive step towards what you're talking about yes i i think getting people back to work as well as establishing cycles of hiring new cadets and having a plan, a multi-year plan to address that, a combination of all of those things can get us yeah. to a position where we will be adequately staffed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask if there's anybody else that wishes to speak to this uh, today, come ahead. Good evening, Good morning. Uh, Sergeant Phil Power with the Halifax Regional Police, a uh, uh, very proud uh, member of District 6. I, I come with uh, a number of different roles. My first role is that I am a, um, the treasurer for the Halifax Regional Police Association Union, um, but I'm more here as a citizen and business owner in particular. I was hoping that I could address the gallery. However, that is not uh, really as uh, potent as I thought it would be. So the first thing is that I own four local businesses here in HRM, and I'm very proud uh, to say that I do. I'm also the chair of the Dartmouth Community Health Board and the uh, co-chair for the central region for the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority Community Health Board. Why well, I believe that's important is people don't understand a lot of the different um, restrictions right now on policing and the different pressures that are happening right now. And if we had unlimited dollars, I would absolutely say Detask the police, that is a great idea. I 100% unequivocally support that as a citizen. I would support it as a union member and of course as a, as a police officer myself. Um, the big thing is, is unfortunately we do not. And as you know, there are two buckets of money, uh, usually uh, provincial, federal, and then of course us as a municipality. And what we're seeing right now obviously is, is that there's a lot of conflict at all of those levels. And uh, just for instance, in our unhoused population right now, how HRM is really stepping up and doing things that are not necessarily um, the responsibility of the municipality, but I commend all of you for doing something and really working towards that. The big thing that I do want to, uh, to really uh, touch base on though, is our level of service and how it is decreasing here in the municipality. And the reason being is because we have so many officers that are off. And the reason why most of those officers are off is because of occupational stress injuries, right? I can tell you unequivocally that uh, it is not something that's getting better, it is in fact getting worse. The fact that we do not have a recruitment this year is absolutely going to be crippling to this city and uh, I don't think we are really at the, uh, the level that we understand how bad it is and that is only getting worse. Uh, we need recruitment like there is no tomorrow. We're looking at different ways that how we can do that. However, it is all after the fact and we are definitely behind the eight ball right now. I am also in charge of our prisoner care facility, which is our uh, booking or our jail as per se. And I can tell you that it is very, very important that we also look at that and we have to look at our facilities because what's happening is um, it is almost a toxic place to come to work. Um, due to our facilities and the fact that we can't do a lot of our jobs due to those facts. So I would implore you as a, uh, as a council, as a city of course, to look at some different uh, ways, but this can't take time. I understand how the BOPC works and everything else. Um, there are processes, but the more that we delay is the larger that we are in a much bigger uh, hole than what we are, right? So uh, that's it. I won't uh, belabor you anymore with any time, but if there are any questions, please feel free. And Thank that, you. Thank, thank you, for, you, Phil. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak to this? Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak to this item? Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward seeing that there is not? Um, I want to thank everybody who took part in the public consultation um, today. Um, we'll be uh, uh, taking a break uh, and coming back at one o'clock. 
um, to go through the police presentation. Um, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor will be in the chair at one o'clock for a while. I'm going over to be part of the press conference. I'll be back as soon as I can. I do think Councillor Russell is going to try to join us uh, this afternoon. Councillor, did somebody have a Councillor Kent? Okay. Okay. So we'll come back uh, at one o'clock. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you just indulge us for a few minutes, we're checking on a process item. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our budget meeting of February 7th, 2024, where we are on um, Halifax Regional Police and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Halifax Regional Detachment uh, budget. We will begin with comments from Chair of the Board of Police Commissioners, Becky Kent. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor and Chair. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, present preliminary remarks on behalf of the Board of Police Commissioner as the Chair, Commissioners as the Chair for Halifax Regional Police and Halifax um, Detachment Royal Canadian Mounted Police in relation to the budget for 2024-25 and business plan. <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit just to remind folks about the policing model history and background. Integrated policing model for Halifax within two separate police service providers with a shared responsibility for one municipality is the model that is in place. The municipal police services of Halifax, Dartmouth and Bedford were amalgamated in 1996 to form the Halifax Regional Police 
the HRP, which serves these largely urban areas. The former Halifax County Municipality, which was primarily rural, with three large suburban areas, is policed by the RCMP Halifax Regional Detachment. The policing model of governance in relation to the work that we do provides civilian governance and oversight for HRP on behalf of Halifax Regional Council, and the Board of Police Commissioners also provides civilian governance to the RCMP Halifax Regional Detachment. RCMP Halifax Regional Ta Detachment services are delivered under the contract through the Provincial Police Service Agreement of 2012 between the Government of Canada and the Nova Scotia Department of Justice. Each agency operates under its own authorities while working together when the uh, situation requires it or it's a, better, it's a collaborative approach when it um, seems the, most, uh, the best way for service delivery. The policing model, HRP and RCMP HRD, is a unique policing model. Agencies have primary responsibility for specific municipal geograph geographic areas. Their integrated operations exist in some areas, primarily within the Criminal Investigation Division. In areas in which integrated operations exist, both agencies offer officers serve the entire municipality. HRP and RCMP are partners in policing with a model that facilitates mutual assistance and coordinated response providing for a professional police service for HRM. Both HRP and RCMP HRD utilize a ComStat intelligence-led policing model to focus and prioritize policing objectives related to people, places, patterns and, prob and problems. Policing in HRM is delivered under a unique integrated service model where HRP and RCMP HRD employees work together in a number of areas, primarily within the investigation, the criminal investigation division, the court sections, and the record sections. <clears throat> Population growth in Halifax and how it reflects in policing services, HRM is a vibrant and diverse municipality which has been experiencing extraordinary population and growth. In July of 2022, the population of HRM was estimated to be st by St Statistics Canada to at 480,582 480, people and is predicted to continue trending upwards. HRM is also home to temporary populations, including a large student population across universities, the Nova Scotia Community College, NSCC, and private career colleges. For tourism, 2022 was a rebound year following the COVID-19 pandemic, with the highest number of over overnight stays across Halifax hotels on record. KP and KPI highlights for, this, for our services include HRM seeing an increase in the severity of crime over the past few years. In July of 2023, Statistics Canada published national statistics on crime across Canada in 2022, including the Crime Severity Indexes, the Overall Crime Severity Index, CSI, the Violent Crime Severity Index, VCSI, and the Nonviolent Crime Severity Index, NVSI. The CSI measures changes in the severity of crime in different geographical areas by giving a weight to each offence type. For example, a murder would be considered more serious than a robbery, and a robbery would be considered more serious than a theft. In 2022, the overall CSI for Halifax went up for the third consecutive year, increasing by 8.4% to 72.2% from 66.6% from 6, 66 .6 in 2021. It remains below the national overall CSI of 78.1, which increased by 4.3% from 2021. The top offences contributing to this overall CSI increase for Halifax were shoplifting of 5,000 and under, robbery and breaking and entering. Finally, the KPI highlights where violent crime, the, the, the Violent Crime Severity Index, or the VCSI, also saw an increase by 4.8% to 104.2. 
from 99.5 in 2021. This took it above the national VCSI of 97.7, which increased by 4.6% from 2021. Before I leave, I'll just say that the Board of Police Commission um, is uh, pleased to serve council uh, in the important role that we do. We have a board that has a great interest in um, coming to the table and strengthening the governance. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of the entire board for the opportunity to serve in this way. And now I'll turn the tables over to our two chiefs to do their presentations. I think you're on. Chief McLean. Excuse me, just before you start, um, Chief McLean, if I might, um, our legal counsel is going to describe the process that we're going to use going forward. So um, <clears throat> it's been suggested it might be too much integration to try and deal with two presentations and, and two separate motions all in one fell swoop. And so um, if council is, uh, is agreeable, the, the thought would be after speaking with the chair and at the suggestion of Councillor Mancini that we hear from HRP first. Questions later, clarification, that the board chair can put the motion on related to HRP and then we would deal with the RCMP uh, budget proposal rather than trying to deal with one motion, which I know folks will want to split the vote on in any event. So that's, that's the proposal, um, unless there's some real objection is probably the easiest way to focus our discussion. I see a lot of nodding already. So, seeing no dissenting body language, we'll go forward and we'd welcome Chief um, Don McLean, Deputy Chief Reed McCombs, and Haley Critchen. Is that right? On I just have a question on um, John's uh, suggestion. So just so I know, we will be breaking this out because I'll be putting the motion on the floor. So we'll be looking at number one first, then number two, and then where are the presentations in that order? So Councillor Kent, what we'll do is we'll have the presentation from HRP. We'll have questions of clarification and then the motion item one can be put on the floor and voted on. And then we'll do the presentation with the RCMP, have questions of clarification, and then two and three get put on the floor. Is that acceptable? Alternatively, we can have the full discussion on the HRP budget ask and, and then move on and put all the motions on the floor at the very end. It's council's wish, it just I, seems. I, 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 yeah, I, Council, I would like to, I think that we should hear both presentations. This is an integrated service. We should hear both presentations from both services and um, and then look at how we're going to approach the motions. But that, as, as the chair of the board, um, I'd appreciate that, but obviously it's the will of Council. <clears throat> so um, by show of hands, and I really do want to respect the chair of the Board of Police Commissioners, absolutely. But um, if we could just have a show of hands if separating the presentation is acceptable. Councilor Menci. Deputy Mayor, I may speak to it. Thank you. So m my concern, I find it confusion, confusing if we have HRP present and then RCMP present and then we have discussion afterwards. Uh, I think it'll be much more clear if we have HRP. I, I, we, can, we can vote at the end. I don't care when we vote, but to have a conversation about HRP, finish that conversation, then move on to RCMP, and then have that conversation, and then vote at the end. All three is fine by me. I just find two presentations, and then we're going to be talking about both. Uh, it's confusing. That's my rationale. Bro. Thank you. Uh, So, so I understand, and so that they're clear, that so the chiefs have clarity. We'll have a presentation from HRP. We'll have questions of clarification and debate. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, debate on what? There's no motion, no motion on the table would, yet, right? Thank you, so, Councilor Kent. It would be that the item one portion, if HRP goes first, then item one would have the clarification. Item one would be put on the floor. It would be debated. <laughs> 
then the RCMP would go do their presentation, mm -hmm. questions of clarification, item two and three would be put on the floor and then debated. And then, we'll vote, on the and and then vote, vote on the whole thing. Whole thing, yes. Gotcha, good enough, thank you. We're good to proceed? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you for your patience, Chief. You're on. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, Deputy Mayor, Chair of the Board, uh, fellow Councilors, colleagues. Um, honored to be here today to present for the HRP budget. This has been a bit of a long process. I believe I was on the job two days when I first went before the Board to talk about budget. And uh, seems like yesterday or maybe six months ago, one of the two. And uh, so here we are today, a culmination of all those, uh, those efforts. Um, yeah, so the Halifax Regional Police, uh, our mission is working together to make our community safe. And what I want to, I just want to highlight on that in terms, because obviously we, we listened to a lot of presenters this morning and, and I commend them for being passionate about what they feel and, and how they believe and what they said and coming forward, is that public safety and making our community safe is not the sole domain of the police department. And I don't suggest for one second that it is. I believe, I believe the police have an important role to play in that but I believe that there are multiple elements that go into public safety and community safety, um, many of which were spoken about this morning. Um, and then the policing model geography and jurisdiction, as we mostly know, there are three HRP geographic patrol divisions, Central, which is downtown Halifax, East, which is in Dartmouth, West, which is in Bedford, and West Halifax. I'll just talk very briefly about some of our successes from last year, certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, certainly our Police Activity League or our PAL program, it's a, uh, it involves the participation of approximately 30 HRP members, which has directly engaged more than 100 youth since its inception. So this is one of our proactive things we do through sport to connect with youth in our community. And we added a, a newcomer focus on, uh, on these groups in the last year. And I think that's very important in terms of police reaching out to its community. The member reintegration, reintegration program, which speaks to member wellness is, uh, and I think probably mentioned it earlier in one of the speakers in terms, is about getting our people back to work because peer support is extremely important. Uh, in 2023, we had 23 members participate in this program. That is. 23 members coming back to work that otherwise would be, would, would, would quite potentially be, be still away from work. So I think that's very, very impactful. Uh, the background and security clearance unit began operating in July 2022 and became fully functional in October of 22. Um, as you all know, as a result of council, uh, the polygraph for pre-employment was ceased in 2022 and now they deal with all of our HRP security clearances, which is significant and we'll speak to later in the, in the, in the budget presentation. Um, during its first year, um, we've recognized the, BA, the, the BASC with uh, several internal awards in relation to the work they've done. Um, in November of this year, along with the RCMP, we hosted the Atlantic Women in Law Enforcement, which brought over 200 women in law enforcement together uh, and in terms of an, a very important event that connects their colleagues from across Canada and network and learn from one another. I had the honored uh, privilege of being able to open that conference and speak to them and, and sit through several of their um, presentations and it, it, it's clearly an, an important thing in terms of, of, of member development and the advancement of diversity within policing. And the creation of the Rainbow Internal Support Network. The Rainbow Internal Support Network, or the RISN as we call it, is a collective of HRMP employees who identify as part of the 2S LGBTQ plus 1A uh, community that are members of the Halifax Regional Police. Um, there's been conversations around their creation for quite some time, but not, not this year, I guess it was late last year, I had the opportunity to speak with them, put them together, and that we actually launched that officially. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the work that they do in supporting one another, and it's something that I hope look, that we can do further with some other groups within our organization. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some operational um, successes over the last year in terms of, since October, we've, we've attended approximately 60 protests in this city in terms of, and I don't 
think that's going to stop anytime soon. And in terms, I, and I would suggest that we've done so in a very, a very measured and, 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 and accomplished manner over the last little bit. And in terms of, but certainly having um, impacts on resourcing. Um, we've taken 463 firearms off the street last year, which was up from 300 90 the year before and up for another 264 the year before that. A lot of that is due to the, to the work within the integrated CID environment with my RCMP friends here in terms of, and what we saw last year, two years ago, we had, uh, within the HRP area, we had 47 shootings. Uh, we had 16 last year. Um, 16 is still 16 too many but I think it's certainly trending in the right area, and I think a lot of it is based on targeted enforcement, uh, some of the projects we've done in, in the integrated CID environment, and I look forward to continuing that. Uh, the Halifax Regional Police Employee Family Assistant Program is a very important group and uh, in, in unit within our, our organization in relation to member wellness. Uh, they provide confidential support for employees who are experiencing personal, professional, or health-related challenges. And their goal is to provide early intervention and support and encourage employees to seek the assistance they may need. We know that um, incidents of, of operational stress injuries or PTSD occur at a much greater rate within the first responder community than they do in the what we would call civil, uh, civilian community, and we need to be prepared to deal with that. Um, ensuring that this function is fully staffed and resources in line with our continued focus on employee wellness and public safety. As you can see from the numbers, from 2019 we had 60, 82 referrals. I should probably wear my glasses. This is actually the first time officially I've ever worn glasses in, in doing something like that, so it should be noted for the record somewhere, I'm guessing. <laughs> it, should, it should also be noted for the record that when the union spoke up here, one of the things they said is, we support the chief of police. So I just want that noted for the record as well. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is true. Yeah, this is true. Um, so 82 referrals in 2019. Um, at the time of this report, it was at 133. We ended at 144 referrals for 2023. I think that's actually a good thing. Um, that people are actually seeking out the, the assistance and the help that they need. Um, we've seen that, that they've been increasing just about every year, um, and that's one of the pieces that speaks to member wellness and one of my asks in terms of the, the budget uh, augmentation. Hate crimes. Uh, we, we, in January of 2022, we started the first hate crime unit in Atlanta, Canada. Um, we have it staffed by one, one officer in the uh, integrated CID environment. Um, they provide support to the RCMP as well when, when necessary. Uh, as we see, the number of hate crimes has gone up you know, exponentially over the last few years. Lots of that we know, and, and people have spoken about it earlier, we know that hate crime is one of the most underreported uh, incidents that occur. But we also know that uh, because of some of the work we've done around with ISANs and some of the community groups in terms of knowledge and awareness, that that uh, that awareness is going up and we're leading to leading to uh, higher numbers of reporting. And we make a distinction between hate crimes, which are in fact crimes within the criminal code, which is very which has a very high bar in terms of what creates a hate crime. But then there's also hate incidents, which aren't necessarily a crime but clearly on the face of it caused the community or the members that are involved like significant concern. So we've seen that number go up uh, over the years from six in 2019 to hate crimes and in, in, in we ended up in 2023, well, Nani was at the time of this report for the board, but we ended up at 116 and we ended up at 288 hate incidents. Um, like I said, the hate crime unit is currently staffed by one detective constable. We've seen that the number continues to increase significantly. And we know that this is just not a HRM issue. I know I, I sit on a call every two weeks with the other chiefs from across the country and we talk about hate crime and protests and all those other things. This is a phenomenon that's being seen across the country and it's something that I think we need to be in front of in terms of, um, you know, and, and it certainly has the support I think from the communities in terms of, of having, that, having those uh, positions. For our 2024 planned work highlights, highlights um, uh, when we talk about responsible administration, the HRP policy refresh and public release of HRP policies, which is a, 
obviously one of the board's uh, priorities. Uh, we'll continue our focus on the overall refresh of our policy manuals in the coming year. We just hired a new senior policy advisor within the last couple of weeks, so I look forward. Um, she's put out some policies already. I look forward to put them out publicly. And this is a significant long-term project. It involves a large number of administrative and operational policies. And as they are added, revised, and updated, we, they will all be considered for publication to our website. Certainly, um, our people, our people is an extremely important piece of our organization, obviously. Um, member wellness, uh, which was a priority from the first day when I walked into this position. Um, we'll continue to implement new, implement new wellness initiatives and enhance our awareness of various programs currently offered within the, the, the department. Our reintegration obviously is one of those. I'm also excited about a new working group around an alternative dispute resolution model uh, within our organization that uh, basically, you know, responding to some of the academic, legal, and, and sociological research uh, throughout the country in terms of having a mechanism that allows member conflict to be dealt with by those things that exist outside necessarily of the Police Act, which gives satisfaction to no one. And um, I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to that being implemented, particularly around issues of harassment and all those particular things, and I, 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 I will champion that to the, to the very last day in terms of I think that's a very important piece of our organization. And from our uh, employee engagement, we do know from surveys and internal talks that employee engagement and recognition is extremely important. I try to get down to the watch, down, down to the squad just about every day, every second day. They probably get tired of me at some particular point. But it's, it's good just to go around and talk to people and, and get a sense of what's going on, uh, making it out the things that are important. And, um, you know, it's very important because, you know, our people are, in fact, the backbone of our organization and, and what's really important. And, you know, the majority do, uh, do a, a great job in terms of, of what goes on. Could we do better? Of course, we always do better. Um, just last week, when I was leaving on Friday, and you have to excuse me because I'm actually really sick right now. So I was actually, um, I actually wasn't in yesterday. Poor Reed was saying, I hope he can come in tomorrow, otherwise he got this. But uh, so I, I met an officer when I was walking out the door and I was like, what are you doing here? She had been involved in, a, in, 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 in an event where she actually got her ribs fractured. Um, and I was like, why are you here? And she was like, oh, I got a, I was going to court and I got to do something and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you know, so obviously I said to her, you know, you got to take care of yourself. You got to do, you know, make sure that you're good. And, and, I, and you know what she said to me? But I caught the guy. <laughs> and really at the end of the day, in terms of, I spoke with another officer the week before that who was involved in dragging someone out of a car who ended up with a concussion. And I called him at home. And he talked about the great support he got from people. And, and he was going to the hospital that day. And uh, he talked about how I hope I get the word that I can come back to work real soon. And that is the majority of the, well, we hear a lot of the other stuff sometimes that gets caught up in the people that are off and all these other things, and, and that's real. Um, but, but they actually exemplify the people, the, the men and the women that work for the Halifax Regional Police. And uh, certainly uh, the service excellence with our HRP technology roadmap. Uh, we'll continue to work on our technology roadmap. Uh, there's a variety of projects, some of you may have seen them in the capital plan, e-disclosure, uh, I met with the uh, the head of the, the head of the Crown Service there two weeks ago, and they're looking at putting something forward, which I think is going to be very exciting for our members. And V Mobile software, which, which which talks about track ARO members and some of the stuff that came up in the MCC um, uh, recommendations. Uh, a prosperous economy, uh, recruitment and intent retention. Uh, recruitment and retention remain maybe one of the highest priorities for our organization. Um, we certainly heard it at the end when, when, the, when a few of the members spoke about the importance of, you know, our membership and the numbers. And um, we do have a cadet class uh, recruitment process open now. Uh, for the record, um, yes, I agree with them in terms of it would have been great to start it earlier. However, we didn't have, we, we, we don't have resources to actually do that. We, we drag people off the side of their desk to do that. That's one of the things I want to rectify in this budget ask. Um, it, also, it also got complicated in terms of, we actually are certified through the Department of Education, and uh, that, requ that requires a certification every five years. Well, guess, guess what year that was? That was this year. So we just got our certification last month. Last month. Last month. Yeah. So we're working, we're working at doing that. Um, 
we will continue our lateral uh, hiring efforts, uh, officer hiring efforts, and, and we'll, we'll do some. We, we have a recruitment plan and a strategy working with HRM, HR now about, about doing that. But we know that the, uh, we know the bread and butter of that is in our own in-house people and, 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 and re recruiting and retaining and, and, and developing our own people is very important. Uh, from a community, community perspective, the Wortley report implementation, uh, I continue to co-chair both the Wortley, uh, Wortley report uh, committee and the subcommittee of research committee, along with Kimberly Franklin from the Human Rights Commission. There was a meeting yesterday with the RCMP uh, who are doing a pilot project within Nova Scotia in the next little bit around race-based data collection. Stats can are, are doing work as well. There's a lot of stuff going on in relation to that work right now. And uh, we will definitely be a part of it. And we will definitely be part of bringing that together in terms of there's, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of technical uh, pieces that need to be considered in terms of, I, we jokingly say that every time we open one door in terms of coming to that piece, we find another three behind it in terms that we end up to. But uh, we, also take the, we also take the position that we're not going to let perfect get in the way of good. So I think it's important that at some point we'll, we'll move that forward. Um, supporting our communities and making connections. We've talked about the hate crime folks. We talked about the, the CROs, which are a piece of my ask in terms of they do very important work in our community on a daily basis. The diversity office. Um, that reaches out and deals with communities. I met with them last week in terms of what we talked about doing about a hate crime consultation within communities. They've done some already in the Asian community and some other communities. We're looking at the African Nova Scotian community next in terms of doing a, how, how a consultation works in terms of, you know, getting a little better at what we do. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to build better relationships with communities by working to meet their specific needs and certainly bolstering HRP training to better su serve diverse citizens. I had the opportunity, honor, I guess, privilege to, to open the Journey to Change back in December. Um, it's very impactful. I, 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 got, I got a chance to stop in three or four times over the week while they were going on. Um, you know, the level of community members that step up to be part of that process are, are, are is, is, you know, significant. Um, the, dis the, the conversation and dialogue which takes place and the emotion is raw, it's real, and it's impactful. And as I said, you know, to, if you ever heard uh, Reverend Anderson speak, and, and he closes our piece up there sometimes, like, there's an impact. And in terms of at the end of the day, just like any training is, it's about when you leave, you know a little bit more than when you came in. And when you know better, you do better. And really, Journey to Change is, is, is a significant uh, uh, module in that, in that case. We are having our next Journey to Change, I believe, in at the end of this month, about three weeks, will be our next change. And we'll continue to, we'll continue to have these at, uh, as often as we possibly can, recognizing their there is a resource, a resource implication on those people who volunteer to show up and, and teach, but um, look, I, I really look forward to continuing that. Our last piece, next piece talks about our staff counts. Approved 2023-24 full-time equivalents were 816.1. Um, as you as you're aware, we, we so we have we've transferred out. Um, 61.4 bodies, I don't know what point .4 is, but I know that it's obviously not, it's just the way they do the math in terms of the bodies around the um, school crossing guards, um, which being transferred over to community safety. Um, new positions in, in stats clerks and, in, and administrative support and intake analysts around FOIPOP and some of those other things. And then service enhancements that went through the Board of Police Commissioners, uh, 18 constables, one sergeant, uh, an EFAP coordinator and two civilian investigators uh, for a total final uh, budgeted to count for uh, 2425 requested, obviously, 778.7. Seven, seven, um, as I mentioned earlier, recruitment and retention are keys for HRP. We have no dedicated um, personnel at all assigned to the police science program. What we have done in the past is, is, is take people from patrol and I'll speak about this later in terms of we, we, gotta, get, we gotta stop doing that, really. And, um, and in order to facilitate the, the, the 38-week um, police science program, um, you know, my goal is to have 
when we're ending our next class, I want us to be in the part of recruiting already for the next one. We, we, we need to be able to do this like on a yearly basis in terms of as part of our actual operational, um, you know, just, just the way we operate in terms of having um, police science classes running at a, at a regular interval. Um, our, our, our past inconsistent approach uh, creates issues. Um, and that's not because those in the past didn't have the foresight. They, it, it, the, the reality, the environment has changed over the last little bit. Where at one time we would have hundreds of, of uh, EPO, EPO uh, applicants, that's dwindled down to almost nothing. They, that, that's trickled down to almost none in terms of, the, lots of reasons for that, but, but that's just a reality in, in which we, um, in which we operate. Um, so obviously a dedicated uh, resources would enable, our, our enable us and allow for delivery of a more streamlined, effective, and efficient program. One thing I do want to note is since 2010, we have had 75 officer resignations. It's 14 years, so eh. 29 people left policing altogether, and that's just, that's just the reality. Some people decide that's just not for them. Um, I actually commend people that do that rather because it's, it's a long time, it's a long place, a hard place to work for someone that really doesn't want to be there for 30 years. I've seen that happen. It's, it's, it's not the best. Um, 46 people went to other police agencies all over. Of note, only three people who left, that left for another police agency, were ever from our police science program. So the people we recruit, the people we hire, and we train, stay with us. So I think that's very important in terms of when we talk about the importance of the police science program. So the operating budget summary of changes, our improved 23-24 budget was 92,345,000. Our new asks um, in the patrol constables, uh, community response constables, uh, police support, civilian, uh, security clearance unit and hate crime uh, unit and EFB coordinator. And we, we, we put a half year estimate on it in terms of working with uh, Jerry and his team in terms of, because we recognize they're not, on, they're not gonna be here in April. So in terms of, as we work forward in terms of getting them together down the road, in terms of, I believe it was a 1.3 uh, million ask in terms of that particular piece. Yeah, just yeah. under 1.3. Yeah. And then we have, um, of, of the net increase of our operating budget to 98, uh, 98 million, just over 98 million at the, at the total there, which is an increase of 5.6 million or 6.1%, the vast majority of, the, these provoge, uh, the, of that proposed budget is required to meet our fixed costs. So that's including the wage and benefits of our members, the equipment, the training, the services, the supplies. Um, I know one of the speakers spoke and you know, talked about, well, the, the police actually said they wanted, you know, more money for ammunition, and is that more important than food? No, clearly it's not more important than food, but clearly for, we're running a police service in terms of having sufficient ammunition for our members to train, all that is actually very important to run our operations. Um, you know, and so in addition to those fixed costs, we're proposing the service enhancements to improve our operational organizational support functions and bolster the level of service we provide to the public. We're looking at reopening some of our, uh, our sites, public facing sites that haven't been open since COVID in terms of them bringing them back because it's very important. I go down to the front door at our police department every day in terms of, and the people that are there every day for service are, is, is significant. It'll be very good to have our other places open over in Dartmouth Oaten and Bedford to serve, to serve those citizens in a more effective and efficient manner. Um, so following our public consultation and, and, and extensive meetings with the Board of Police Commissioners, um, certainly, I mean, I think, the, I think part of the discourse about the conversations with the Board were not robust or were not extensive, I think is, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the situation when the person sitting in this chair in terms of, that wasn't my experience, and in terms of, so we talked about uh, the positions I already spoke about, but the sergeant and the and down to the and the 12 constables for the patrol division, uh, which as um, proposed by the BOC, two of two of those positions would be seconded community safety for a minimum of three years in, in support of the community safety program. Um, 
And I just want to talk briefly, I don't want to eat up all the oxygen here in terms of like how did we get here in terms of what, like I said, I was on the job two days and we talked about getting into a budget conversation. My rationale and my, my process was around, I did a couple things. One is that I looked at what were the budget asks from before? What, what, what did the chiefs before me ask for? And is that still important? Is that still a priority? Or are there ways that we can mitigate some of those concerns around with doing different things? So there were asks around sergeant positions, and, um, and, 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 and it was good to have the HRPA there because there are some things I think that we can do within our collective agreement that are able to satisfy some of those issues without asking for more people. And I think that's very important. So when we talk about that, when we talk about, uh, um, I think one of them even mentioned it, when we talked about uh, the IES component in terms of, of, of doing a different schedule in terms of providing more IES work, those are things that we can do within with, within our power in terms of, and some of them are innovative, and some, some of them are, 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 but they're not about asking for more people, they're actually about doing things a little bit differently. Um, so we did that. Then, 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 then we looked at where are the stresses at? So before this position, I was the Deputy Chief of Operations, and I dealt with the union on a regular basis around dealing with what they consider, you know, staffing issues, which clearly, which clearly exist in terms of, of certain things. So, so we looked at doing certain things around how overtime was a lot, where, where at one point we would have had two people coming in on overtime, working their respective shifts. We work a you know, seven to seven, seven to seven sort of shift in terms of, well actually, rather than bringing in two people that will cover those two shifts, why don't we bring in one person to cover like from a noon to a midnight shift, you know, in terms of, it actually takes away, that actually reduces that two to one but at the same time speaks to the peak hours when we actually need people. So these are the kind of discussions we, I, I wish to continue in as we do contract negotiations coming up recent, uh, uh, soon. These are some of the things I, I, I wish to present uh, you know, as, as part of our deliberations. Um, just before they came up to speak to me, they actually served me with notice of, of, uh, for bargaining, <laughs> personally. So we're, we're now into our, our bargaining phase with the, with the uh, with HRPA, so I look forward to that. Um, we'll continue to address our, our staffing challenges. Um, you know, then the, then the other thing I looked at was around the challenges around staffing <coughs> are two, two, twofold. One is, so we looked at our overtime, we were using, and it was mentioned, we were using overtime to, to staff for daily, daily occurrences, not sustainable. Um, so when I looked at, um, Part of it is we can do indirect augmentation of our frontline response, which is by where we would have taken people off of shifts before um, to do certain things. Um, we need to put the position. So that's why the hate crime, that's why the, uh, the um, background security clearance positions, that's what that speaks to, because we take people out of patrol to do that. Uh, that, that talks about uh, some of the position, the position around EFAP coordinator. We had a frontline EF uh, person in terms of from uh, seconded for the last year to, to be that second body. So we need to, full, we need to fully fund that, I think, in terms of get away from the front line. Um, and then at the same time, then there's about the direct augmentation about increasing the numbers of patrol members that are available. Because we, we do know reintegration is important. We're getting people back to work, but we still have a significant number of people off on uh, on various um, injuries and other other reasons, which is which I which I which I think is just indicative of the landscape of Canadian policing now. That we have to be, you know we're kind of late to the game. We've been we were actually quite we did quite well for a number of years in terms of the people that we had off. But I think in terms of and I think I think it was it was always a tenable position at best. And I think COVID just kind of lit the fuse for it. And in terms, it's, it's been difficult to come back ever since. So in terms of illness and stuff that we deal with. Um, so in terms of um, certainly the expansion of the CRE, the CRO uh, function in terms of, I think CROs are extremely important in communities. I think they do a, a, a incredible work. I would like to be able to uh, put them in communities that where they, we can extend some of their footprint around, not just geographically, but actually hours of work in terms of that, you know, everyone I go to says, you know, our CRO does a great job, but they're kind of done by four o'clock. So I like to expand that with more CROs in terms that have availability to do certain things. Um, and then the patrol members, and, and, and maybe I'm the, maybe I'm, I'm the, it's my own fault for this in terms of, 
I think there's been a bit of a misconception around, because uh, mental health response is, was a priority of mine in the sense that because I have a statutory obligation to do it. Um, and I've been quoted several times here just today and other places where I said I like to be out of the business and 100% I like to be out of the business. I think the chief before me would have said that and probably the three chiefs before him would have said that. And in terms of most of the chiefs across the country say that actually in terms of being out of the business. And I actually commend HRM for taking the place in terms of community safety where they look at civilian led um, mental health response um, going forward in terms I think that's very important and I support that 100%. But I don't think in terms of the way the legislation is suited right now in terms that I can just walk out of the business in terms that I still have an obligation in terms of being able to respond to some of those things. I think, um, you know, and the board has been, the, the board has been great in terms of you know, trying to reach out to the government and change some of those things. I've had conversations with, with, with uh, provincial government leaders in terms of doing some of those different. But I think at the same time, I think we have to recognize that. So when I talk about we, we, we took 640, give or take people to the hospital last year in terms of for the, under the uh, involuntary psychiatric treatment act in terms of um, no, nobody wants to take people to the hospital for any length of the time. Uh, like it's, it's not something people want to do. They, they do so because they believe they have no other, op they have no other choice. And that's something that they have to do in terms of, of taking them forward. Even, even the new community safety model in terms, I don't believe actually has the, has the process in place in terms of where they're actually taking people to the hospital. In terms of, are some things be able to mitigate that data? Go, don't go to the hospital? Great, 100%, I certainly support that. But there are some people that actually do need to go to the hospital. It may in fact be the only time they actually get some medical help in terms of, is when we, we take them there. The mitigation point that I talked about was around, so we spend upwards of 4,000 hours in the hospital last year in terms of, so these new officers were not about, it's not about, being able to provide better mental health um, service, although I think anything that's better is well better in terms of in in, in terms of um, in mental health training and all those other stuff. I don't think anyone's making a suggestion that um, uh, police officers who receive critical incident training or the police officers that work in the mobile mental health unit that work alongside medical health professionals are in fact as well trained as medical health professionals. I don't think that's. You know, I don't think that's the reality, but I do think they work very well together, and I think it's a very, and I think it's a very um, positive, and it's been a very successful program. But I think part of the mitigation piece when we talked about capital health was around. So, um, if you take, if you if you estimate 640, that's about 1.8 people today per day that are going to the hospital, spending upwards of eight or seven hours in the hospital. There are people that aren't patrolling communities or doing things because they're sitting in the hospital and then multiply that by three or four in terms of, because that's, you know, on any given weekend, that's how many police cars. You go on to the, if you go to the hospital on the weekend, you'll see just about as many police cars in the hospital parking lot as you will at the police department. Um, that's an unfortunate reality. So one of the things we looked about was being innovative with, with the health services. So can you actually give us a place where maybe we don't have to spend as many people in the hospital? So maybe if we have three or four people here, we can actually have one officer that's it's more, of a, it's more of a physical sort of solution in terms of being able to watch over some of the people there because as I said, there is a statutory obligation to remain under police authority until such time that they're either seen or dealt with by the hospital. And, and, and I get people's places that maybe the, the hospital isn't the place for police. Um, I mean, that's more of a philosophical question in terms, but I can tell you that the, the legislation doesn't read that way. Uh, I can tell you that the hospital, um, the hospital wants us there in, in, in terms of, I just got some communications from them there that they're actually looking at having us there more often in terms of through different means. So I think that, you know, that's, that's very important in terms of, I don't want to, I, I don't want to give, you know, short shift to anyone that spoke earlier that talks about, you know, mental health challenges and all those other things. I, I, I get that, you know, it's an unfortunate, this, this is my first kick at the can doing this. Um, you know, it, it because I obviously went through the board of police uh, process. It, it's unfortunate. I think that sometimes this becomes a very adversarial conversation as we sit with the police and certain members of the community in terms of, because a lot of the things that they said earlier, I actually agree with. I actually agree with, we're not gonna police our way out of a homeless situation. Poverty is, is terrible and we need to do things about it and, and all those other things. 
there are some things they say that I don't that I don't agree with clearly in terms of you know um, the negative impacts that the police have on with on people. Again, not discounting people's personal experience, and I, I never do that. But at, but at the same time, I think the police have an important part to play in in this whole conversation around community safety. It's not the only word to say. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think in some of the discussions we have around community safety, this this is not an either or solution. I don't think this is either, you know, all this or all that. I think some of this has to be more collaborative. I think we kind of have to work together. What I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, is get in front of the curve in terms of, you know, the amount of, you know, we know probably everyone that sits in front of you from HRM is going to sit here and say, we're growing at such an exponential rate in terms of all these, and it's going to have service impacts and all these other, but, but it's true. I mean, you know, I, I've seen the plans over in Dartmouth, the places that are going to have thousands of people, and right now we're all woods. There's going to be schools in there. There's going to be places. They're going to be, you know, that that's an impact. People talk about HRM, Halifax having a million people by 20, whatever that is in terms of, you know, you know, the, the, the challenge is, again, this isn't about, I'm not suggesting that we have to staff ourselves to a million people today, but at the same time, these decisions we make and, you know, this process itself leans itself to year by year, year you know, uh, I think we need to be a little more, you know, forward future thinking in terms of what it looks like in particular um, to, 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 uh, to our organization in terms of, you know, like as the union said, they agree with me, but they don't think I asked for enough, <laughs> you know, the other part, you know, but, you know, but at the same time, I ask for what I think is actually um, attainable. I, I think that's important. Like, I, I wouldn't come here asking for things. I, I was asked at the board, like, is this like the gold standard of this is everything you could? No, it's not. There are other things we can do. Uh, clearly, you know, I know traffic is a huge issue for most of you people in terms of, you know, all these things. Could we have a more and more bus traffic unit? Sure. But we could also mitigate that some with, you know, with the province coming up with red light cameras and some of these other things that maybe can mitigate against some of those issues. So I think all of those things come together. Like, I just, I just you know, I, I, I don't come here in, in a sense of, you know, I, I came here from listening to my people, to looking at some of the stats, uh, to looking at some of the, you know, I listened to the board. I've, I've been to the board for the last few years. I listened to the board ask, but they wanted more information. So I tried to give them more information this year, uh, as much information as I think we possibly could. and. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is uh, when the baby starts talking, it's telling you it's time that your time is done. So in terms of, uh, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Good job there, Councillor Smith, in terms of just sitting there saying it was time to vote. But, but, at, but, at, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave it there in terms of, I'm sure there'll be more discussion as we move forward, but uh, I'm uh, happy to be able to present to you today. Thank you very much, uh, Chief McLean. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Smith. <laughs> we now will have <clears throat> questions of clarification, uh, not debate yet, but clarification. So, Councillor Mancini. Thank you. Uh, thank you, De Deputy Mayor. Just very quickly, Chief, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I love it that you went off script, uh, and that's good. Like you're, you're giving your own opinion. Yeah, I know. We know that. It's very quick. I, and it, just because I missed it uh, earlier in your presentation, you talked about. We had 60 protests since when? What was that time? Since the first of October. October 7th, actually, in terms of. Since October of 2023, we've had 60? Yes. Really? Okay. The other one I didn't catch, uh, the, the number of police officers you've lost. You talked about the 46 that went to other police agencies, but overall, the number of police officers lost were how many again? Oh, uh, 75 since 2010. Since 2010. And the last thing you. That's just resignations. That's not retirements. And that's not, because uh, those things will always continue. Retirements yeah. are, 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 you know, a natural state of evolution in terms of any organization. And but we're do you know that? About resignations. Do you know, Chief, do you have any numbers? If you don't have that, it's okay. Out of those 75 you lost since 2010, how many went to other police agencies or a yes. percentage? Yes. Yeah. 46. 40, oh, sorry, you mentioned that earlier. Sorry, yeah, 46. And the last thing, a clarification. You alluded to it a couple of times. I'm not sure what it is. You may have said it, but I missed it. What's an EFAP coordinator? Oh, sorry. The uh, Employee Family and Assistance Program oh, coordinator. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks, Chief. Yeah, I have other questions during debate time. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. <clears throat> Councillor Hensby. Just a quick question on the staffing numbers. You talked about those who left either retirement or elsewhere. How many members we have on either on secondment or on sick leave that are not, or how many vacant positions do you have? Uh, through your chair to the councillor. Uh, secondments, we, I believe it's probably eight currently today. 
Uh, those are to either with the RCP in the, to a federal unit or to a provincial program. Um, I assume by sick leave you mean extended sick leave and not, not, not just day to day. Um, sick leave is a combination of on-job injury as well. So we're probably the combination of that is somewhere around, around 50 officers. So a long-term disability or just sick leave? That's a combination of long-term sick, long-term disability, and long-term on-job injury. Any, any expectations how many of them may be returned to service? Uh, we're, we're constantly working on that. We have another 25 that are working on, on temporary accommodated duties. Then they're on their way back. And it's, it's, it's a constant flow of in and out. We, we, officers get injured, they go off, we're, we're constantly getting them back. Um, it's, it's a slow process to get them back, no question, but they are coming back. As the chief mentioned earlier last year, 23 officers went through the reintegration program. So that was 23 that came back into the workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just had a, I had a question. It was, it was mentioned in the public comments um, earlier as well about the multi-year plan. And um, Chief McLean, you were talking about, you know, being future thinking, f forward thinking. And I'm just wondering, is there a multi-year plan around succession planning, like knowing that there's seven, I believe, seven retirements <coughs> happening this year? Um, we have the population growth. Like, ha is there um, some kind of plan that's being developed to look at our needs and how we're going to get there? Yeah, through you, Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, we've looked at the uh, seven-year uh, ex uh, seven year potential retirements. Um, not, th not that everybody will retire as soon as they hit their date, but we've looked at a seven year plan and we've looked at what we, we think we need each year um, to, to replace those. So that's, that's not expanding our force, that's just the succession of the people that could leave. And so that, that speaks to us needing that in-house police science program running steady every year for the next seven years just to meet that anticipated um, possible people leaving the workforce. Yeah, and, and to that, so in terms of in the board package, so um, by 2029, we have 208 people that are eligible to retire. That doesn't mean they're all going to retire by 2029, because you know, some, some may leave early, some will stay on longer in terms of, but that's just from a baseline piece. But that speaks to the part of why, um, why um, a robust uh, uh, Police science program and, and, and planning stage is very important in terms to our a sustainable. Uh, you know, n that's not about growth. That's about you know, keeping the lights on. Yeah, succession planning. Okay, mm -hmm. that'd be great. It'd be, it'd be great to see that at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief, for the presentation. Um, the piece I want to ask about, um, just because it, it was. It's come up uh, in I think the last two budget um, years as well. Um, the officers that are off on long-term leave, um, you know, it's one that we talked about and like the pressures it then creates on patrol and on everyone else who's left doing the job with fewer people around. Um, and I'm curious, um, that number you quoted about 50, um, I'm try I was trying to remember back to last year what it was. I feel like it was about the same, and so it's good that we've done the kind of the, the, the programs obviously bearing some fruit in terms of people going back, but are we actually, are we just treading water on that, or are we actually starting to move that needle in terms of getting people back, uh, back on the job? through your chair to the council. We believe we've stemmed that tide, but I want to be very cautious when I say that, that you know, it was growing and now we, we've sort of flatlined it. And it, again, it's, it's um, working with WCB, they've introduced some new programs that are helping get people back to work sooner. Plus they're working with our reintegration. So that's, that's gotten the people back to work, but obviously we're still, we're kind of maintaining the status quo right now uh, for lack of a better answer. Okay, so that my that was my recollection. I was like, I think yeah. that number's about the same it was last year. So, uh, okay, thank you for that. Yeah, I would just add in terms of it's it's a <coughs> excuse me, it's a complex issue, yeah. 
as, as I'm sure you're well aware, I would liken it to like it's, it's like a container ship in terms of it takes a while to turn it around, but in terms of when you, but at least we started, we, we seen the slowing process in terms of the inertia, in terms of the slowing process. Uh, like some of the things the deputy talk about, about integration and WCB and all those other things and in terms, but, and they all speak to other things around member morale and, and all those other things that, that we try to contribute to in terms of, you know, being, being impactful on, on that situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this presentation. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I first want to say is thank you for your support during the wildfire and floods. Um, certainly unprecedented uh, times in front of us. Uh, I also wanted to uh, just mention thank you so much for the conversation that we had uh, around human trafficking. Um, really appreciate it, uh, your time, Chief, and uh, looking at ways that uh, Council can become more aware of the human trafficking that's happening here. And so I just wanted to uh, also thank you for uh, hosting a presentation uh, upcoming for us uh, here at Council and staff to be more aware uh, of the um, crimes that are taking place in particular with youth and in schools, and so when I hear you talk about extended hours for CRO, uh, I think about the important linkages uh, that police officers actually have in IDing, right, to be able to recognize um, young people who may be in those situations. I do uh, just wanna say though that I was, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to understand when we look at those kinds of crimes, human trafficking, um, child abuse, uh, you know, recently I had a conversation with a woman who, uh, you know, sh she actually was sold into a pedophile ring at the age of 10. You know, these, these are really horrific, life-changing um, things that are happening. And I know that uh, RCMP and HRP are working close together in addressing um, these serious offenses that are happening um, in our city. And I just want to know, you know, what... What you know, similar to the to the conversation that we're having about future forward and future looking, um, there are more and more uh, you know incidents of crime that are happening that you know are becoming on our radar and are that are taking place in the municipality. And so I feel like we're always doing this catch up and trying to you know catch uh, uh, and prosecute these people when in fact we just don't seem to. Ha be able to get in front of it. So I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about how it is that, you know, that this is an operational budget and we're trying to address the issues we have today when in fact, when we look at the fraud, human trafficking, you know, the abuse that's happening uh, with young people, how is it that it, this budget in the future is gonna change so that we have a better understanding of that research and that work that we can Counselor put into Lovelace? having the staff members, excuse me? Oh, sorry. I didn't realize this was on. Um, is there a question for clarification well, regarding the budget? To that question, okay. I was asking that question. If I may continue. Yes, we we're just looking for a question of clarification. Yeah, that's okay. So my question of clarification specifically is around future budgets, which is what I was trying to get at. So we have an operational budget in front of us now, but clearly when we look at um, the advancement of crimes moving forward, I'd like to know how it is that uh, HRP, RCMP are gonna be coming forward to us with a budget that actually meets the need of this community in the future and what's happening today as far as new crimes. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a good question there, Councillor, in terms of, um, like I say, you know, the, the budget process we have currently, uh, you know, in, in terms as, as, as all I see it, in terms of through the board first and all those other, I think some of those are discussions I think need to, need to take place at the board level in terms of, you know, what they see as priorities going forward in terms of in helping to, you know, um, inform you know, budget asks in terms of priorities and that sort of stuff it's, going it's forward. I think that's that. I think that's what's most important. It's mm -hmm. it's very difficult to say what we're going to put in the future when we're, we're not there. I, I don't really know in terms of you know um, 
Well, we know what's happening in other cities, too. Yeah, yeah right. no, well, clear. And we, and we, we need to learn from, from other places in terms of, you know, we'll see, you know, technology will, will play a big role. We'll see, you know, AI has great implications mm -hmm. on certain things. It has terrible implications on some other things. So in terms of, you know, in our integrated CID um, um, environment, in terms of that would cover most of those things in terms of one of the things that, you know, we're good at, but that's actually good in terms of having some of the, you know, the research capability stuff that the RCMP bring forward to the table in terms of that stuff, but just around the resourcing and all that other stuff in terms of being able to deal with some of those issues in terms of like, so you talk about trafficking, for instance, in terms of a big piece of trafficking, um, uh, responses around awareness in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. so, so training to, to um, um, you know, hotel staff and all the other stuff in terms of when they see something, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's something not right about that in terms of uh, reporting it and that sort of, and we've done that in terms of delivering training to the, some of those places in terms of, then, then it's just, and then there, there's uh, resources available through the province and all this in terms of, um, for the people at home actually in terms of to see the signs of what may actually be traffic in terms of, you know, you see you, your children showing up with things that they just should not have in terms mm -hmm. of because, you know, and those other things that are that are very important in terms of, so I think some of those things going forward in terms of, you know, what our future budgets will look like, I think will be, will, will, will be informed by these things as they actually evolve. And, and, and certainly those are discussions I think are very important to have with the board. I think that may be some of the most important things, the discussions that we could have actually at the board level. Yeah, proactive budget is what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, if this strays too much into debate, feel free to cut me off. <laughs> you will. I, I'll I think come I'm back. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to ask about the uh, patrol constables, because Chief, of course, um, uh, you well, you were there in downtown Dartmouth, the uh, very early days of your appointment um, with some of the folks um, who have concerns about police presence in the community and um, what they've seen is not there hasn't been enough lately. Um, and so things that, one of the things I'm going to struggle with this, this budget is that ask versus the ask of other folks about police reform. Um, so I'm wondering about the, co the patrol constables. On the ground, like out there, what does what do these additional constables mean? Like, is are they? Is it Bedford? Is it Dartmouth? Is it Halifax? Is it across the board? Like, what? How does how does adding these officers actually then show up out there in the rosters in the community? Councillor, uh, very good question. In terms of, so the, the initial ask was for twelve, which would, would and we're doing the simple math around. Uh, around three, you know, three watches would be about four per watch in terms of, um, but but really what it is is the watch commanders who have the day-to-day -day control of our resources in terms. So when they when so they have the ability to move people around as as well they should. It, it's not the it's not me at home or the deputy at night sitting there going send three people to Dartmouth and <laughs> two like it's the watch commanders who are on the road making those decisions right they need to have the pool of which they can make those decisions from. But we need to also start from a place of, because uh, we, assign, we assign officers by division, central, east, west. And, um, and so then we have to make the decisions around where do they actually go in terms of into the mix. Because on any given night, any patrol officer could, could work any division, because really those, those, those lines are artificial, right? And if something big happens somewhere, well, everyone's gonna go. That, that's just the reality. But at the same time, and um, it's, it's important that we have a significant amount of people per, per each watch that are going out in terms of um, um, fight in, in, into their communities. Inter cause you, and you could have sick calls. Like, like four people could call in sick tonight in Dartmouth, for instance, then we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to adjust to that on a daily basis. So that's, that's the latitude given, given to, the, to the watch commanders. Um, one thing I didn't say when I, when I spoke earlier in terms of, you know, we hover around 100,000 calls per year. And then you may look at it and you say, well, you, you did more calls back a few years ago in terms of, you know, in terms of, but the interesting part of that, you have to, you have to do a good analysis in terms of, so where are the less calls coming? They're, they're not less calls for robberies or, 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 or criminal offenses. They're the proactive calls which have gone down significantly over the last couple of years in terms of the traffic stops. So the people driving around your community, the proactive stop and walks, 
that those are the calls that have actually come down. So the stuff when people say, rather than just going call to call to call to call, the stuff around when people have the visibility around, like I think beat officers are actually very important. Like I, I think beat officers are a good, a good thing in terms of it. But the challenge with it is it becomes very difficult to have the beat officer program in terms of place when you're struggling to fill your cars to get to your calls on a daily basis in terms of, and that's, that's part of the challenge in, in terms of when we talk about, so where they would go it would be all over, but decisions would be made in terms of, I think, they would affect every division, okay. clearly. Would the same apply for the response constables, the community officers? The CROs? Yes. Yeah. Again, the, the original ask was for six, which would have probably given me two per two and two in terms of four gives a different direction. But I think, I think we do have some, um, you know, we have some, uh, uh, I, I think priorities come around in terms of certain areas in terms like, you know, downtown Halifax has, has certain priorities in terms around certain things. I'll be meeting with their business community. So I, I expect it to go exactly the same as the one I met with you. Yeah. So in terms of, um, you know, downtown Dartmouth, um, you know, the same sort of thing in terms of, but at the same time, you know, their, their footprint gets expanded, you know, to other areas as well. Um, but you know that's that's certainly and that's some of the questions you know some of the things we'll have to decide as we as we move that that forward. But I can tell you that going to that meeting that day, in terms of actually got my head around the expanded CRO program in terms of because some of the things that people said, in terms of actually got my mind to thinking as to why that that request actually came vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, this, this is good uh, questions of clarification here and, and discussion. I, I appreciate it. Um, I, too, was happy to see the CROs on the list. Um, I, I, I agree. I think they're very important, particularly at the community level. Back to the retirements, you know, and I'm just trying to get what the big picture is here, because right now, every year, you know, um, business units come, including you know HRP and RCMP come and they, they ask for additional positions here and additional positions there. We're trying to balance that with retirements. Retirements are already funded in the budget, so that's more of a replacement piece, um, which you know makes the recruitment position, the, um, uh, the recruitment positions um, in here really important because I can see you know, why we need to fill the vacancies as, the, as they come, especially when you mentioned potentially 208 by 2029. That's, that's a significant number. Um, but back to the, the bigger picture, like understanding what is a full complement. If the situation around policing has changed and we know we have a number of officers who are on leave for various reasons, um, this isn't unique to HRP. This is, you know, a, a, you, something that's happening across the country. Um, you know, I can, I, looking at some police stats here, and uh, and you know, see that uh, officers on leave, like there's, you know, 20% is kind of the average. Um, so I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, like, what are we trying to achieve? Again, back into like this future thinking, long-term plan. We have retirements, we have absenteeism, we have changing crime patterns. Like what is our, what is our goal? What are we trying to get at? Because I think what for us here at council, when we're trying to make decisions about funding and positions, having that big picture view of you know, what it is that we're trying to achieve would be really, would be really useful. And I really appreciate that there's some things that we can't predict, either around crime or around, um, you know, um, pandemics, for example, would be another one, right, that we're still recovering from, that, you know, these things do happen. But having a baseline, I think, I think would be helpful, because otherwise we're kind of operating in these year-by-year -year kind of, you know, vacuums without understanding the, without understanding the big picture. So uh, I guess, you know, my, back to my question, my question of clarification here was, um, you know, what, I, like, what is it that we are trying to achieve here with, with the employee complement, the full-time, the full-time complement at HRP? At least I, I think I understand your question. So <clears throat> in a very short answer, 
we want an, enough resources to come to work every day where we don't and, and where we can deal with the unexpected sick calls and some of the stuff that we can't control. Um, we, we don't want to rely on overtime. Overtime, as we've heard from other, other people in presentations, <laughs> it, it's just it's a cycle going in the wrong way because people are working more than they burn out, then they go off on long term injury. So I don't know if I'm answering your question exactly, but we're trying to get to a staffing level where our watch commanders have enough people coming to work every day with some of those unforeseen circumstances that they don't have to call in on overtime. We're not burning our people out. People can get discretionary leave every now and then, you know, with their bank time. You know, we, we can go back to an era when, when I first joined, you could actually get a night off on a Friday night. That that's not existent anymore. You know, people turn their phones off because they're getting so many calls on overtime. So we really just we want to get to a place where we we have enough staff coming to work for for the for the well-being of the, of the citizens, but also for our own members. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question because I don't have a hard number right. because it's different on Friday nights in the summer than it is on Sunday nights in, in, in February. You can never predict it, but we know ebbs and flows of calls. And the watch commanders have that discretion when they have enough people working to let some people go home, have some discretionary leave, or can not, not necessarily need to call in on overtime. So, so that's, it, that's our end goal is to have enough resources to, to, to meet the needs of, of the I think the I think you get 100% what I'm getting at. Just to see that on paper would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cottle. Councillor Austin, you're back. I am back, but very quickly. Uh, community response officers, um, one of the gaps that uh, I think we have um, has been around, you know, they work typically kind of daytime, nine till four or five, whatever the case might be. Um, they'll come in for some extra thing if there's a community meeting, but you know, we don't have community officers into the evening shift. And what I see in my community often, um, I've plugged this to I think three chiefs now, um, is a gap in the early evening hours. And I'm wondering if there's any consideration with the community response officer where we're adding bodies to looking towards an evening shift of community response officers. That, that actually was one of the things I actually spoke about at the board in terms of, and again, part of it came from that discussion in terms of, but I know it otherwise, I know it anyway, in terms of, first I don't want to say, community officers work all, all, all time, they, they work weekends, they do all kinds of things in terms of, you know, I want to be clear in that regard, dealing with specific issues. But one of the things I talked about when I had my initial ask was around expanding their footprint from a, from a, from a time sense in terms of, you know, in terms of, um, we still have to work within the, the, the contract only allows them to work certain hours of time because of where they work in terms of the, there are contractual limitations in there. But there, there are certainly, those limitations don't, uh, uh, aren't against working say till 10 o'clock at night or something like that. But I think that was one of the things actually I actually looked at that I thought would be actually, would be a good thing moving forward in terms of um, having some CRO um, capabilities, you know, into the evening. And that's not everyone working two o'clock to three o'clock in the morning in terms of, so any of them who are listening now, they're sitting there going, oh my gosh, the chief wants us now work to three o'clock in the morning. Right. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> but I think it is important to expand the footprint in terms of, because the, the work they do actually could extend a little bit further. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Councillor Stoddard on a question of clarification. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor, sorry about that. Um, just a quick question. Um, I understand um, from the report that you no longer receive funds on summary offense tickets. D wasn't there one time you used to on summary offense tickets? Our CFO has uh, got his mic on. He might be able to help us here, Councillor Stoddard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jerry Black with CFO. <clears throat> I think if you go back maybe 25 years, um, summary offense tickets revenue was uh, was in uh, HRP's budget as a as a revenue line. Uh, it hasn't been. I know I've been around for close to 20 years, and uh, it hasn't been. It was in finance for a little while when finance managed um, parking enforcement. And then it switched over to um, corporate.
corporate compliance and planning and development and is now with uh, Public Works. Okay. So the uh, summary offense ticket revenue moved to those business units, mm -hmm. but just last year uh, we, did, we uh, made a corporate decision that that revenue would reside in fiscal services. So it's outside of any, any business unit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Um, so seeing no further names on the list, our agreed upon process was to put item one on the floor and then to, for a debate. Uh, Councillor Kent, would you like to make that motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that Halifax Regional Council one, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Halifax Regional Police HRP proposed 2024-25 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the accompanying plan and supporting presentation attached to the report dated January 24, 2024 into the draft 2024-25 operating budget. Second. I'm sorry, I didn't hear who seconded that. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Appreciate it. Councillor Kent. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, I have, I have remarks to say, but that are more um, specific to both, both uh, <laughs> budgets. So I'm just gonna offer them and, and you'll understand which ones uh, go where, but mostly they're more generic. Uh, um, so I'm pleased to put this motion forward as the Board of the Police Commission Chair. You know, we gave the, each police service uh, careful consideration. We, I think we had more uh, process this year, and I think the chiefs can attest to that, more process that, from what I'm being told of in the past. We had uh, th three presentations for each, each um, chief. We had supplementary reports. We had uh, two public presentations, one virtual and one in person to make sure we accommodated as many people as we possibly could. Um, we, uh, when we, um, requested information for our debate, you know, the, the chiefs were responsive. Um, I was really, I thought it was very encouraging certainly to get such a good turnout to our, our, uh, our meetings for public presentation and I can't agree with every comment that was made <laughs> today from some of the presenters, um, but it is important to hear from folks. You know, it, I think it's also worth mentioning that you, uh, we don't always hear from the majority of the population. In this case, I could do the math, but you can do it as well as I can, um, about uh, you know the percentage of pe folks that come in. And usually, in my experience, in the career that I've had, those that are not stepping up, yes, there are some barriers sometimes, and some folks don't have the means of transportation, a number of things like that. But in general, um, I think we'd be hard pressed to find anyone that would like to see the police not available to them when they need it. Um, insight uh, from the lived experience is really, really important. And, um, it, it, you know, I agree that uh, mental health uh, approaches, and, and I know the board and the chief spoke to it, um, Chief McLean spoke to the board's uh, interest and our, our strategic pillars, of which you all saw the plan on a page, is very clearly has the two major factors including included in it, which is a priority for how are we are policing within the constructs of addressing housing and homelessness, and it comes down to the core service that the police serve um, to to do that work. We we know there's a role, but we don't see them as a role that is as deep in as perhaps we were pushed to in the past. And the but there are many many many. Uh, issues that come forward for policing and are beyond that as well. And um, public safety, I think the public safety office here at the municipality is one of the, the biggest um, change makers that I think will contribute to the policing services that we provide, uh, that our two services provide. And what I'm particularly pleased with right now um, as the chair, and I think the board is as well, is that we have our leadership that in place right now that are looking for uh, collaboration, effective, <laughs> seamless ways to address many of the of the issues that are there. Um, in, 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 together, if not together, certainly um, 
contributing to the conversation around models. And you, you know, our policing services are at the table around um, intimate partner violence uh, approaches, around the mental health crisis calls and, and service delivery, around community response, around our um, the police science program and the hate crimes and, and such. Those, those are and the general duty. I can't, I can't agree more with the, the, the chief around the importance of the general duty. Those are the folks that are front facing to our residents of this municipality, and they need. We hear every day how much they don't, they, that they want to see them, and if we don't resource them in a way that will provide that, I think we're fighting a fight, a, a, a tough battle. Um, <sighs> Obviously, delivery to the public uh, is, is number one. P public safety, delivering their service to the public. But our member health and our recruitment and retention play the biggest role in how that delivery is provided. If we don't have a healthy service and if we don't have a recruitment and retention plan and program, that we can actually act on. So when we have these young cadets and, and, and transferring, um, changing of career, uh, more mature cadets and lateral moves, if we don't have the capacity to bring them on, how can we potentially uh, improve and better the service delivery that we have? Um, it's, it's our members are, is my time up? No. Councillor Kent, you're very welcome to come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. <laughs> Councillor Mason. I love Becky when she's in full flight, right? It's so passionate. I mean, it's too bad we can't lend our time like the American Congress. Okay, so very quickly, so I don't run out of time. Uh, you know, we heard a lot of really passionate people today who said a lot of stuff which I think they'd be surprised how many of us agree with a lot of what they said, right? I mean, they're not, you know, uh, th this is not far from what we're talking about both in terms of at the board police commissioners, in the policing services, and in community uh, safety. Uh, I also just have to say, because these kind of things drive me crazy, like food action, the, the, the Halifax food action thing was not not funded. We have not gotten to budget to fund it yet. So that, that's an uh, argument for a future time. Uh, I was pleased to see in the budget that the crossing guards are being moved to community safety as we discussed last year. Thank you for that. And I like the discussion of the reduction of overtime. Uh, I wish I had seen that more directly put into FTEs, but I, I get it, right? Like we're seeing that money uh, not being used for overtime. Uh, and I agree we need to maintain it for when you need to bring people in, uh, you know, at a certain level. I think we're probably going to get back down to pre-COVID levels in this coming year, and that'll be kind of a good benchmark. Uh, what we heard from the folks who were here was that we need civilian-led crisis response, and I agree with that, and council agrees with that. We voted to do that. We voted to do that. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you have no police, and it doesn't mean that you don't increase police funding as you grow, in my opinion. It, and it doesn't mean that the police never go on a mental health call. They're going to go on mental health calls. They're legally obliged under the Police Act to go when ordered or called to a mental health call. But the fact is that uh, you know we need to stand up our street response that we've been talking about, our public safety response. And it may be that one of the people in the truck going around with the mental health nurse and the social worker is a police officer in plain clothes. That's what's happening on the west coast of the United States. They're not going out there with police. Uh, it's it's uh, simply not the case. So, you know, we don't talk so much about uh, defunding the police, but we have talked about detasking the police. And I want to say, and I've been saying this to people for the last couple of weeks as we come up to this, it's like in the mid aughts, there is a move to get rid of park patrol and get rid of the port police and make the police do everything. And the end result is you don't have time to do those things. You just don't, right? And what we need, you're, you, you call when it's a criminal thing. But when I went out on that ride along uh, uh, before, I guess it was end of last summer, uh, Ninety-five percent of what we what we were called to respond to was social work. Uh, there was one criminal thing, and I tell people, and it was just because a very drunk guy didn't want to pay the cabbie who was getting out of his cab. That was it in the whole night in downtown on a Friday. Uh, and you know what did I see? Mental health, parking, noise complaints, all stuff that bylaw officers could handle, that compliance officers can handle, that nurses could handle with police backup when needed. Uh, no police officer is going to get out of their car and issue a ticket in downtown Halifax on a Friday night and wait for a tow truck. That's not going to happen. We need to respond to that. We need to take that off their plates. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, we could be talking about here, 
but uh, I want to remind council that last year council directed staff to reduce the overall budget that was asked for by community safety in January. We cut eight FTE positions from the budget. Uh, those FTEs are required to fully fund and roll out the uh, public safety strategy. I also want to tell council that, uh, the, and the board members know this, that the Board of Police Commission passed a motion in November that uh, asked the Halifax Regional Municipality recommended that Halifax Council fully fund the public safety strategy in the 24-25 fiscal year uh, to the amount originally identified in the plan. So for me, I can't comfortably vote right now to increase the police budget absent of having seen the community safety budget and whether or not those positions are going to be funded. And I, I think everything that we heard from, from the acting chief makes a lot of sense, but we also need to either slow slightly the increase in funding of the police to make sure that that eight or nine hundred thousand dollars is given to community safety to hire the people to actually roll out the plan we endorsed and then didn't fund, right? We want to do all the things we heard from these people today, but we didn't fund it, so we need to get there. Uh, I got 43 seconds left, so I will come back after people talk. I have a motion to defer and ask for an update on what that cost would be. Uh, and I would do that to both, uh, to after the motions for both HRP and RCMP, but I want to hear the discussion today and a motion to defer that passes would end the debate and I don't want to do that yet. Questions for you, Acting Chief and your staff is, uh, I had a question about commissioners under contract. Are they, are, does that fall under the HRM living wage policy? Because I had a, a former employee of the commissioner say that, they're, that it doesn't and I'm wondering about that because HRM is committed to a living wage. You may not have the answers on that right now, but hopefully we can get them. Uh, I did want to clarify, my understanding is that the act says that if we're going to do, a, if you were going to have uh, someone that the police handed someone to when they're doing an admin for mental health, the act says peace officer, not police officer. So that could be a special constable. That's my understanding. I understand that has been a big debate at the board. I'm wondering if you could tell us what the cop for, per cop Mason, for all of like HRM is for all of HRM for both forces. And I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Deputy Mayor. So to the counts, can you, can you just clarify what those questions were again? Yeah. To, uh, our commissioner is paid a living wage under your contract. Uh, uh, does the act not say peace officer, not police officer? So special constables could uh, wait at the hospital. Uh, the cop per pop for all of HRM, both forces, full population. It's a, it's a unified force, so that's yeah. the number that matters. Yeah, no, so for, 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 for your first question, I, I, I can't answer the question for to your first question. I'll have to get back to that one. Um, your second question um, was around... Uh, peace, peace officers. Peace officers, yeah. So I, I do believe the IPTA does, does specify peace officers in there in terms of um, a okay. particular phase. But it also talks about those that take them there need to stay with, like, so in, in, in terms of... And I used to have the act in front of me right now. I don't have it right in front of me. So you can't do a hot right. handoff from one police officer to another. It's the same. No, 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 no. I think hours. I think you can do that. Well, it's I, a peace I, officer. Yeah, anyway, we'll come yeah, back. I think you can do that. And then at your last piece, and I have it in here some, but I, I believe that the overall number for cop to pop is 158. Okay. All right. I'll I can back. clarify that exactly what it put up, but um, it's I'll come back. Thank you. Did you want to? Um, <clears throat> Jerry has a comment to add. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor, for your question on living wage. Um, commissionaires would would fall under the, I think, the security category and would fall into uh, living wage, but I'll, we'll come back and, and confirm that, but I'm pretty sure they are. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Smith. Thank you, Chair, and I will definitely try not to run out of time during your watch. Uh, so, <laughs> And thankfully, I've had lots of time with this with this budget and, and discussion uh, with the chief, or both chiefs and, and staff, and also the, the public. So we've gotten lots of feedback, and uh, so I really don't have much much questions. The one question that I I want to clarify, um, but it was actually clarified already, just around the the school crossing guards, because initially I didn't see it, but then I just had to dig a little deeper, and it's in there. So happy to see that. Um, so so really, for 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 me. Uh, colleagues and again we've had a lot of discussion at the police commission and you know it's it's a little disheartening sometimes when we hear that we're not listening uh, as the the commission and I understand because it seemed that when we're not listening if we don't agree 
Um, but if, if, if folks listen to the entirety of the meetings and, and look at the minutes that we, we do ask questions around the budget. Um, you know, there was a, when we had this in front of us, um, I was one of them who, who supported some positions, but not all. Um, and ultimately because um, the, the, the majority wanted to support all of them, I didn't vote for the entire budget. Not because I didn't support what some of what's being asked, but I don't support all of it. So really it was, I had to vote against the budget. I would have liked to be able to add the hate crime, because as we, we heard that there's folks who, who don't um, want to report but we've seen an increase in reporting through through the stats that it's it's working. Maybe it's not working to the highest extent, and I probably that's why we need another one. But that's not the question today. And, and today is really about uh, giving what's being asked for. And you know, with with what Councillor Mason has, has laid out, and we'll bring the motion forward, and maybe I'll speak about it. Then you know, the community safety plan actually has actions around the mental health response, transportation, and supporting. Um, emergency response folks in the mental health call and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I really think that we have the tools in front of us. We have to obviously make sure we use them right and that will take some growing pains. But at the same time, you know, there is a concern that, that there is a lot of police time being spent. And I hope that, that when we get the report back at the police commission around the, um, the involuntary uh, care act that gives clarification on what it means by a peace officer and who can stay and who can't stay. So, so and for me, not being a lawyer, it's clear to me that a peace officer could be someone who's a special constable, but at the same time, it's who picks the person up. So do we need to have somebody who's responding with police who then goes and then stays there? You know, those are questions that we have to have to ask later on. But all that to say is, is you know, I didn't vote for the, the, the budget at commission for the reasons I mentioned earlier around, I, I do feel some of the positions are needed um, uh, to deal with some of the issues and, and if this doesn't pass, and we'll have that discussion at the commission. So today I won't be voting for, for the budget just on the sense that we can't really talk about the inner workings because that's our role at the police commission and I'll save it there to hopefully, if, if it comes, it, it goes to that place uh, to have those further discussions. So I'll leave it there and come back when Council Mason brings up this referral. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, uh, Chief, and uh, Chief Superintendent to you and your, uh, your member, the men and women that serve uh, our city. I thank them every day for that work. I uh, appreciate it. Public safety isn't solely the responsibility of the police. That's Chief McLean's quote, and I agree wholeheartedly in that. There was a speaker this morning that said, desperation leads to crime. I agree with that also, and that's the situation that we're in right now. Uh, and HRM is not keeping up with growth. I mean, Chief came over to Dartmouth, we sat down with the folks from Clayton Development to talk about Port Wallace. It's 10,000 people, the size of Truro, we're putting in there. Last count, when I just did a rough high level estimate in Dartmouth alone, either under construction, approved, or potentially could be approved, 30,000 units, Dartmouth alone. And you know, Councilor Elliott will speak about Bedford and the growth that's gone on there for the last number of years. So we're, when we look at policing, we're simply not keeping up with the growth. Um, a few questions here, Chief, um, and you talked about member wellness uh, in your presentation, but since the last time with the previous chief sitting here at budget time, you know, what, what has been done since last year to support officers with their mental health? I mean, you know, we know policing is tough, putting on the uniform, uh, morale has been, you know, morale has been down with policing. Uh, being a cop is a lot different from, you know, when I was a young person and the way that we l young people look at police officers. Uh, you know, my big question is, I'm asking what's been different? Are officers getting the help they need? Do you really have their back? Because when I speak to your members, and when, every time I see one of your members, I, I talk to them, I introduce myself, we have a conversation. I ask them, how are they doing? Some of them tell me, some of them don't. But so I have concerns about that. So that's my first question, watching time here. Uh, any update on the body-worn cameras this discussion? If you could, please, that that would be great. Um, and again, if you could elaborate, if new, if we approve what's uh, in front of us today, 
in those officers you're asking for, when are they actually gonna start work? Because you talked about the police science class and the challenges that we have, but I think it's important for people watching and understanding, even if we approve today and give you the thumbs up, and, uh, and we approve the budget overall in March to go forward, there's gonna be a big lag before we even get those officers hit the, hit the street. So if you could just talk to that a little bit more. Um, is there any data that's showing that there are better results when police officers have fulsome mental health training? Is there any stats around that? Uh, and if you don't have that today, maybe it's something we can take a look at. But I mean, you're talking about these new officers going into, to, um, into hospitals uh, and you want to give the mental health training. You know, what type of mental health training is that? And what's the data uh, connected to, uh, to that? Uh, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to come back later on for the second time around. So, Chief, I'll, we'll start there. Uh, and, and that way I'm also scared of the, the chair, too, so I want to finish your way. Oh, it's, it's the easy chair now. I didn't see that. It, it, <laughs> go ahead, go folks. For ten. Go, for ten go, go for 10 minutes. That's right. Uh, Chief, uh, and I'll come back for the, those questions uh, uh, later on. Through your chair to the counselor. I'll, I'll start with probably the first oh, question <laughs> um, around, around the wellness. Uh, right. So we have a full-time wellness coordinator in, in <laughs> HRP, and, and part of her strategy deals with uh, mental wellness as well as physical wellness. So that's a full-time position that's, that is uh, continually running, running programs, whether it's through nutrition, whether it's through courses on sleep, proper, proper diet, proper exercise, uh, things like that. So, so the, there's a a constant wellness program going on within HRP um, for, for the members' well-being, and that's, 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 part, that's her full-time role is to do that. But we do have officers that are off because of impact to their mental health due to the job specifically, right? And, and I know last year we approved the psychologist. I think that person's still not in, in place yet. Uh, you know, what are we doing about getting those officers back and preventing future officers uh, to go to leave the job because of their mental health? Yeah, you know, one of the other programs, and I, I think we've mentioned it before, is we have uh, a safeguarding program, which is for a lot of our positions, we have um, mandatory psychological uh, assessments just due to the nature of the job that they're in. And these are some of the high risk jobs that the sexual assault inves investigators, forensic investigators, just to name a couple, but it's, it's, and every year we keep expanding that to where we're now going to a pilot program where we're gonna offer uh, voluntary wellness checks for all members. Um, we're not making it mandatory for everybody yet, but it, you know we're working with the union on that. But right now we're going to roll it out and make it voluntary. So, so the the wellness coordinator also works in areas of resilience, and we offer courses on resilience. So, so it's a combination of all of those things to try and prevent the the the, the, the occupational stress injury before it occurs. <coughs> Just to add to that. Um, a few years ago, we were lucky in our senior our senior leadership team. Uh, um, we had uh, Dr. Kucher mm -hmm. presented yep. to us yep. one day. Um, Senator Kucher, I guess. I, I believe he actually got he got named to the Senate the day he actually was in meeting us, actually, because he stepped out. Yep. And uh, so he was talking about. So obviously, he's you know renowned in terms of uh, you know mental health and, and and adolescence and all these other lots of things. And one of the questions I asked him was, I said, so around resiliency, around all the, like what, from your perspective, what, what's the best thing someone can do, or what's the situation in terms of maintaining their own, you know, their mental health, right? You know, I, I don't know, I was expecting some fancy program or so, I, I don't know what I was expecting in terms right. of what, what I asked, but and he said, you know, the most Im important thing from his perspective that you could have, and I'm paraphrasing a bit now because it was a few years ago, was around having a close-knit support system that you trusted and that you were able to speak to the things that were bothering you in a timely fashion. So that speaks to things like, so when we try to do debriefs and things on things when, you know, significant events occur in terms, even at the shift level, even if they're informal, in terms of, you know, having these conversations about, uh, you know, um, that actually help. Right, so, so formalizing that in terms of actual debriefs, but in terms of the squads that actually come together in terms of, you know, 
talking about when things, when they have bad calls and they occur. And not, that's a, so that's very important to me, right? Um, <coughs> your other question was the body worn camera, I think, was next. So actually, um, so that funding was reestablished because it was never actually really kind of taken. It was always still there, right? The coordinator position. Right. So we will look at bringing that back up again in, in this Good. budget. But, but I think where we're at now, we're in a better place. I think we're in a better place because my partners here next to me are going to be instituting right. uh, a, a program uh, very soon. I'm not sure exactly what it is, right? And I'm basically going to steal it from them, right? right? That's in terms of, you know, I've, I've spoken to their leadership. Well, not steal, borrow, you know, whatever. But in terms of, um, I, I've spoken to their leadership at the deputy level in terms of, you know, that they 100%, you know, research and all this other stuff that they have in terms of for us to be able to roll out that program. And, and at some point a decision has to be made in terms of what's good, because there, there's significant, there's a cost to it, probably right. a capital cost at right. some particular point in terms of, you know, rolling that out. Uh, your next question was, so I, I wrote down leg, but I'm not sure what it the, meant. Uh, but, the, uh, uh, if uh, uh, budget approved, you give the go ahead for the new officers, you alluded to earlier on, when are they actually gonna hit the road because there's a lag by the time you get to buy, approve, they're not going to be showing up uh, next month. That's for darn sure. Yeah, no, no, not at all. And I think you know that's part of the challenge in terms of police, but that you, and, and, and police staffing in terms that you have to be so far ahead of the the curve because it's not someone you can go out and hire tomorrow. In terms, although you know, historically we've used you know experienced police officer programs in terms of, but, but right now it, it it truly is a it truly is for those who, what I would say. You know, transitory police officers that don't mind moving all over. I was never one of them in terms of born and raised here. I have no desire to leave. Like right. transit that wants to go, you know, in terms of, um, um, it's a buyer's market for them. Like in terms of where, where they want to go and all these other stuff in terms of almost nomadic to a certain certain degree. Um, we also, we've also spoken about, you know, making sure we have a very good relationship with the Atlantic Police Academy that, that we'll be putting through two classes this year in terms of, I think we have people going over there relatively soon to get ourselves before some of those people in terms of and, and let them know what we have to offer and all this. So there's, there's multifaceted pieces, but, but clearly in terms of it will be, um, you know, this year will be tough. This, this year will be a challenge. I don't think it's as frightening as maybe, you know, was presented earlier in terms right. of, but I think um, is, uh, you know, establishing our robust police science program in terms that's sustainable and, 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 and um, ongoing and, and that sort of thing in terms of, and, I, and I'm sure that will be, at, uh, I, I think we'll, there'll be enough positions going around in terms that we'll be able to, um, that that would be a good thing for the policing in Nova Scotia, not just HRN. Okay, thanks Chief. Thank you. Uh, Jerry? Uh, thank you, Chair, and just to, uh, to Councillor Mancini's question, uh, and the Chief uh, mentioned that in his presentation, the, the positions the new asks in the in the budget are prorated at 50% annual right. funding. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. For that yep. onboarding. I understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I I just want to start by saying that I that the tone and tenor of this discussion today has been very positive. Um, I want to thank. Um, Chief McLean and HRP, as well as my councillor colleagues, um, you know, just recognizing that things are changing, that we have very much changed the discussion around what policing should look like, what it can look like, and how we're addressing it. You know, I'm very proud of the establishment of the um, community safety office, the public safety office, and the work that's being done there. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to hear the things that are happening at HRP, um, both uh, you know, in terms of the Journey to Change pro um, program. I'm not exactly sure what that is. You talked a little bit about it, but recognizing that that change is needed and we're actively implementing that change is really positive. The discussion around mental health, not just in the community and how we need to appropriately respond to mental health in the community, but how that needs to be mirrored within the force itself and, and how we treat employees and that these things are a reflection of each other. And so I think a lot of positive change is happening and I'm, I'm very proud to see that. Um, 
so you know back to the budget uh, you know and this is and this is where you know it always becomes a bit of a contentious issue particularly when we're looking at um, a budget an overall budget increase at HRM um, you know which is really quite high and um, and you know trying to mitigate all of that is is definitely um, a challenge uh, you know, when I look at the what's being presented for HRP, again, the community response officers, they're really critical to communities, especially communities like Spryfield that I represent. I know the value of, a, of the CROs and, and very much um, support that coming back. They were cut during COVID, um, which I never understood, so I'm very happy to see that back. Hate crime, you know, again, that's one of those things that we are seeing more and more of in the happening in the community and we need to have a response one of those things that we might not have been able to predict 20 years ago that we're seeing now and and we need to put attention on those issues and so i'm happy to see that the employee and family assistant positions that's about getting people back into the workforce and keeping them in the workforce so important right particularly when we know we have people who are off for various reasons you know, part of the challenge is, you know, we need to add the new positions, but we also need to get the people back who were already paying to be there, because this is this is a big big part of the problem. So very supportive of that. Um, the background and security clearance piece um, about screening recruits. That's uh, all. I see that all part of recruitment, and I see that as, um, you know, as we've noted with retirements and growth, that we that we need to have that recruitment piece in place, and so supportive of that. Um, the 12 asks for the new patrol officers. That's where I do have some questions. I, I've, I've heard what you've said, and I'm, I'm really considering that. I'm also you know, thinking about the motion that um, Councillor Mason is looking at bringing, bringing forward, that yes, we know we need to grow, but what is the right rate at which to grow? And um, you know, is there an opportunity perhaps to slow that down a bit um, well, you know, we're waiting to see what's happening with the with the public safety office. Um, you know, often when we're bringing in change, you know, you, while a new system comes in, you still have the need for the old system. It's not that it's going to switch out automatically. You need the time for those things to to grow and mature, and and to find out how they're going to integrate and work together, and and where some savings can be um, can be made from one to the other. So I. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to wait for Councillor Mason's uh, motion and the debate that happens there to see where that goes. But you know, overall, I, I think there's a lot of really positive things in this budget, um, things that I think we can all be proud of. Um, even our residents, uh, you know, in addressing many of the concerns that were spoken about here today. You know, we are we are in the challenge that, as was noted, you know, the we've eroded the the social safety net. That's not us. But we still do have that jurisdictional responsibility, and and I get that, and I support that, and I understand that. So, um, you know, it's just where can we make sure that we're making you know good, responsible fiscal decisions, not just within this unit, but within all of HRM. So, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for this presentation. And um, the first thing I want to say is hello to the watch party over at Mount St. Vincent University. Um, uh, it's great to see students interested in the police budget and learning. Uh, I want to thank everyone who spoke today, who sent in correspondence. Uh, I think one of the takeaways for me personally uh, from all of the presentations um, is how much the provincial government has actually failed us. Uh, not invested in mental health, not invested in public housing, not and choosing not uh, to support those folks who need uh, social services assistance and a, a raise in income assistance, and the list goes on. And that is my takeaway. The municipality, at the end of the day, does get to keep 70% of all property taxes that we collect, and the other roughly 30% go off to the province for provincial responsibility. So I urge uh, everyone to talk to their MLA, uh, to talk to their member of parliament. You know, the municipality 
can't uh, accept, um, you know, the responsibility for social services unless we overhaul our tax system and rethink, how, you know, where that money is going to go. At the end of the day, we are a growing uh, municipality, and I will say that the majority of people that I've spoken to in my district are saying, where are the police? We need the police, and we don't have enough. And that's the message that I'm hearing in District 13, him is playing St. Margaret's. Uh, I will say that uh, I, I think if we look at um, the overall vision of policing in the municipality, we need to think about reprioritizing uh, what it is that we're spending the money on, but also to think about what is coming as a municipality grows, as a city grows. We know that there are other challenges because there's a playbook with larger cities. I mean, just look at the vehicle thefts uh, that are taking place in Montreal and Toronto. Look at the uh, rise in domestic violence across uh, the country. And I think, you know, Alex Livingston, he, he, when he spoke today, he said, we need to think about refunding social services. Well, that, yes, but the municipality doesn't fund social services. That's not our bailiwick. That's not our jurisdiction. Um, and I do think that, you know, uh, when I look at the framework for action on family violence, which came into place in this province in the 1990s, you know, I, I, I chief, I'm, I'm looking at this saying there's no dedicated IPV investigator within the Halifax Regional Detachment. So at this point, it seems to me you're suggesting that a creative solution is to actually get intimate partner violence unit in place. So Chief, I'm, I'm trying to come up with, you know, the fact that the last 30 years, uh, social services organizations uh, supporting women and families and children have been saying we absolutely need to have intimate partner violence addressed. So I wonder if you can speak to that where, you know, I, I don't see this as a creative solution. I see this as, as something that should have been done long ago. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Is there a response to that? That was you. That's in your budget. Oh, how am I, I'm sorry about that. This is the this is the confusion with this budget process. Uh, I think I actually had a minute and a half left, Mr. Mayor. So again, this this comes down to who's doing what, where, when. Um, so I guess my question is out of order then, and I need to wait until we're actually discussing the RCMP budget. Uh, but I, so then I will put you on the spot, uh, Chief McLean. Can you talk to me about uh, your intimate partner violence unit, uh, domestic violence, and, and the work that you see as far as the numbers continue to increase uh, for domestic violence um, in HRM? Yeah, to the counselor. So we have a dedicated intimate partner violence coordinator that works in our organization. One, plus civilians that work along with them. So one's a police officer, then civilians. Uh, but the majority of our intimate partner calls are responded to by first respond, like they're responded by um, our patrol members at the patrol level in terms of the, and the training that they get at the patrol level in terms of, um, which is Q and A through sergeants and, and, and all this other stuff. Um, you know, very serious matters would end up in integrated CID. Okay. But uh, in terms of, um, thank you. So the deputy just reinformed me in terms, so we have one officer and four civilians that work within the internet primer piece and they, they deal with offenders and, 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 and some of this other stuff. Our day-to-day -day response, yeah, it's kind of weird to come Sorry, back. Sorry, no, it's and really hard to see. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> but the majority of our day-to-day -day calls that we respond to, someone called right now about an intimate pilot, uh, partner violence, a uh, domestic case, it, it will be responded to by our, our patrol level responders who, who, yeah. who receive training and, and, and understanding and, and, and know ODARA and all these other things in terms of uh, responding to those issues. That's, that's who deals with the majority right. of them. Um, Constable Iraq, who is the person that works in the office, has a, has a a role in terms of coordinating, particularly around offenders and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Okay, I'll, I'll reserve my question, Mr. Mayor, for RCMP. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, <coughs> it's three o'clock. We're only going till four o'clock uh, today. So I'm wondering, do people need to take a few minutes? A bio break, maybe five or? 
Maybe we'll just take five minutes and we'll chat with um, with Superintendent Christie whether he wants to be here because it's unlikely we're going to. We haven't done the RCMP presentation, right? Probably not going to get to that today if there's a motion coming, I'm guessing. But we'll have a conversation and see what he wants to do. We'll, we'll just take five minutes, okay, colleagues? So let's try to be back because we only have an hour to go.
Okay, folks, we're going to gather again. Okay, uh, Chief, uh, you had a good reunion with uh, Barb, uh, St. John, uh, at lunch. She I'm trying to get her back. <laughs> <laughs> Barb worked for the police, she's worked for the Navy, but she's got great connections. Now she's in our office and she's amazing. All right, colleagues, we're going to go back on our list. We're debating, we're discussing the police uh, budget um, and uh, the HRP budget. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's good to see you back in the chair. Uh, Chief, last question. I, last time I asked you a question, one you didn't answer. That was, is there data showing better results when a police officer has mental health training? So I'm going to ask you some other questions if you could answer that one. Um, so I think we all agreed we don't want armed officers in the hospitals. We've talked about that at great length. We talked about the possibility of the peace officer. I know in Ottawa right now, colleagues, they're actually doing peace officers going to the hospitals uh, with those that are mental health uh, crisis. Um, you know, and Chief, you talked about the hospitals want somebody from a security point of view involved. Uh, I'm wondering, and this may be for uh, a counselor, I can't, uh, if she gets a chance, can you update us where that motion is? Like, where is that the police, Board of Police Commission? Because it, as the Chief alluded to, we need legislative change so that it's not a police officer, but I think uh, the uh, counselor to my left here talked about it could be a peace officer. So, uh, you're, so if, you, if someone could give us an update on that, I don't know if you know what that is. No, there's a, the, there's a national survey by Angus Reid Institute that said three out of five Canadians, 60%, feel less safe today than before COVID-19 pandemic across the country. That's happening right, right now. Um, you know, today we heard the defund, uh, detask conversation, the letter was signed by 800 people. The, we heard that quite clearly. We, our inboxes are full. Our people stop me in, in, in the, uh, uh, on the street. However, and they say, and they will we'll complain as they did last budget, that so many people spoke against it. Why are you supporting the police? But I will tell you, and when I look at my district and I look at when I speak to people in Woodlawn and Montebello and Dartmouth North and the businesses in Burnside, and when I speak to my colleagues downtown Dartmouth uh, uh, business people and here in Spring Garden Road, they're asking for more police because they're concerned about safety. Uh, you know, the folks said detask, reallocate the funds from policing to go to food security, real housing, social support, mental health supports, poverty, access to housing, help with uh, income assistance rate to go up. I agree with all that. That's the province of Nova Scotia, as Councillor Lovelace said. It's the province of Nova Scotia. They did say, though, we should be supporting library and snow removal, community centers, free programs for youth and adults, community care, public transportation. I agree we should all do that, but it's not an either or. It's not an either or. We, d we need policing, we need to make sure as we are outgrown our police department because of the, the rapid growth of our city. And so I am looking forward to the motion that the Councillor I mean, Aston is bringing forward because I think there is a parallel path with our, our, our public safety group and I need to hear from them also uh, and before we make a final decision, uh, but we do need more policing. So Chief, if you could just answer that question I asked earlier about the data showing better results if your officers have mental health training, and what is that mental health training you're proposing that these officers that would be going to the hospital, can you give us a description of what that is? Thank you. I, I don't know if I have any data per se or any, but what, we're ta what, I, what I can tell you is that the, the, their training would be, that, so we, we've had a longstanding and I think very successful um, collaboration with Capital Health with the mobile mental health crisis team in terms of, it's been going on for, for many years now. Uh, I, I used to oversee it at one particular time in terms of and the number of calls that they go to and the issues that they deal with. Um, I think, you know, I have no doubt there have been, you know, certainly you know, a lot of speakers got up and, and, they, they, and they spoke about things 
and, and events, most of which most of which did not occur here, like most of which that occurred somewhere else. Uh, right. You know, and, um, and I'm not diminishing that, but but I'm I'm saying that I think I think we can show that, you know. And, and the board had presentations from, you know, Matt White at Capital Health that helps administer that program. And in terms of, I think they show, so they get a, they get a level of criti critical incident training that's, that's, that is um, provided through Matt White's people and, and the, and the um, psychological care people in terms of, and that's why I would envision that our officers would get something very similar to that in terms of, you know, no, does that make them doctors? Of course not, right? Is that, but, but, you know, does it make them, um, does it make give them the ability? Because there are a lot of officers that have actually a lot of empathy and compassion and understanding that right. deal with people on a daily basis in terms of um, <coughs> some of these issues. And, and I think that I think we've seen from the success of the MOBA, MOBA mental health crisis team over the number of years. And like I say, we have a long standing. There'd be a lot of, of data that's available through them in terms of that we've had a very successful program. And I, and I think that you know could 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 it, could it get better is would, would, would a totally civilian-led program be, but I can tell you from their perspective, I think they, they value our partnership with the, police de, with the police department, the officers that go in in terms of, you know, they're dealing with some, sometimes some high acuity people in terms right. of, right? But I mean, but at the same time, when I say we take 640 people to the hospital, that's only a fraction of the amount of actual mobile mental health uh, of calls that we actually deal with. Like there are thousands of other calls that don't end up at that level. Um, that are that are dealt with and are dealt with appropriately, and, and and are dealt with compassionately, and with empathy, in terms of you know by the, by patrol officers on the street, and, and in terms of and with mobile help. But 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 I mean I think that um, you know the reality that more training is always a better thing. Like you know more training around around mental health and all. It, it's, it's just a better for all of us actually at at the end of the day because we deal with it so so much in Free terms point. of, you know, and not just even at the police, but anyone in the service industry that, that, that deals with, who's in the service industry deals with people with mental health issues. Like that, that's just the reality of, of where we, we, know, we know that, uh, you know, when they talked about back, like one in five people had mental health issues at one time, and deal with, you know, in terms of Nova Scotia and all that, yeah, that, that's just the reality, right? There's not all people that the police are just dealing with, right? These are, you know, a, a, across the spectrum in terms of nobody, certainly me, nobody wants to see People with mental health issues, um, you know, treated unfairly or or or, or 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 have violence brought upon them and all this other. But but at sometimes the levels, you know, the, the situation itself actually, for the safety of the other people involved in terms, of actually requires a police response, right? You know, the RCMP, unfortunately, you know, they they lost a member because of that right. in, in Vancouver, and uh, you know that that that. You know that's 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 a reality we have to deal with in terms. So right. I think that you know certainly that's that's important. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Thanks, John. Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. In terms of the question of where things sit with respect to the motion right at the now. Board of Police on on this issue of um, sworn officers um, accompanying. Uh, those need, needing mental assessment. So that is um, with staff for conversations, Department of Justice. There's, there's essentially three issues. One is there's relatively broad powers to appoint um, individuals as peace officers for that purpose, um, but it requires ministerial approval, whether it's the chief or directly by the minister. For a peace officer? To, to appoint either a special constable or some other individual, whether it's a sheriff or otherwise, as a peace officer for the purposes of the legislation um, which is set up to deal with that. Okay. And, and so the, the, the challenge will be the risk assessment with respect to the risk to those in the hospital itself and others in terms of providing that. The second issue is in the, in the legislation, it's, I guess the third issue then, besides the risk and, and, the, and the minister's willingness to entertain this, is that currently the legislation requires the individual who, who takes a person into custody for the purposes of an assessment to stay with them for the entirety of that right. period of time. And right. so um, either there needs to be a workaround in, in which would be additional bodies, not less, um, or potentially change in that legislation. So those, those conversations have begun between staff okay public safety and, and Department of Justice 
Um, and so, but there is there is a path forward potentially. Okay. But it's not going to happen right away. So, well, so right don't now. hold off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you uh, Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Before I get to the meat of the motion, I got to say, you know, there's a point, you know, where it's the officer coming in with someone who's being uh, admitted, and then there's another point where we're providing extra duty officers for the hospitals, you know, like there's, there's a point where they need to start helping to pay for this, in, in my opinion. Uh, the hospitals, the North Scottish Health Authority, especially if their system is so slow, it's taken 10 and 12 and 18 hours to admit. That's not what I'm going to talk about, though. So uh, as I've already laid out, uh, last budget, uh, we did not fully fund the eight FTEs for the uh, public safety strategy. And I think we need to fully fund this to roll out those programs that are in the safety strategy to address what we heard today. Uh, the board has also asked for that. They asked for that in November, the Board of Police Commissioners. So my motion is about deferring the decision today, and it would only be for the motion on the floor. It wouldn't do the RCMP. It would still come back on Friday to talk about that. The motion is uh, to defer so we can get a full picture of what's coming, get the community safety business unit presentation and ask for a sub report about what would it would cost to fund it. It also has the language in it that it could potentially be funded by a reduction of Halifax Police and RCMP budgets, but it doesn't say certainly will be because we don't know what the options are. We're asking for a staff report. There's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts. Have the cost changed since last year? What are the funding options? Is even some of that already funded in the business unit presentation we haven't seen yet? Might be, we'll find out. So my motion is that the budget committee defer the motion until the community safety business unit presentation and pending receipt of a supplementary report that outlines implications of and updates the costs of fully funding alternative one of the March 7th, 2023 staff report entitled Halifax Public Safety Strategy 2023 to 24 to 2025, 26 to potentially be funded by a reduction in proposed Halifax Regional Police and RCMP budgets, and if passed, refer this to the Board of Police Commissioners for consideration. Second. And I won't go on. Th thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. I won't go on any farther than that. The other big piece on this is um, that it's about $800,000, just to give you an idea. Like we had the number if you go back and look at the staff report. So, so we need to validate where that's at and, and how much has been funded this year. Uh, in their business plan and how much remains to be funded. And uh, I suggest that we hold off. We need to see all these things lined up next to one another before we make a decision. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, Council, I'd, I'd like to suggest that the time for a deferral might be after you have the, the police um, motion on the floor as well and debated. And I say that because um, at the time today, it looks like we'll be doing HR, or, sorry, RCMP on Friday have a little bit more information perhaps from public safety and the CAO, but it's it's up to council. Councilor Mason. Look, I'm open to do that, except we have a motion on the floor right now, and if we vote on it, then it's passed, We're right? Decided we would not be voting on these motions until after the until RCMP, after we and we have them all on the floor. Well, okay, I can hold off then. I mean, I we can just, just end it here and come back withdraw that and I'll withdraw and until, with I'll withdraw until Friday, if that's the will of council. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Jerry? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just just for context uh, with the Budget Committee, uh, staff has advised that community services, we did at our budget direction meetings, advise that we are putting forward a complete budget and that all business units are, are funded up. Um, the only uh, ball item that uh, we did say was coming forward was uh, with respect to the uh, RCMP because that is a contractual um, uh, arrangement. But uh, since since we gave that information, there was a piece that came forward yesterday from Community Safety on the Food Action Plan Park B that was not funded. That came after their final target was issued. So it's just that amount that that's not funded in community safety at this point. Okay, so just so in terms of process, where we are, John, what are you suggesting that we, we close up here if nobody else wants to speak on correct. this topic? Correct, and then we hear from the RCMP uh, first thing on Friday, um, the RCMP motion, and then we can decide if there's a desire to defer um, the, the, the motions at that time, and uh, we'll be able to get some clarity around what, what is currently being brought forward 
um, in the community safety budget. Okay, so the motion has been withdrawn. The seconder is okay with that. We'll continue the debate on this budget. Uh, as presented, Councillor Outfit. Um, thank you, Mayor, and uh, I, I probably would have supported that deferral, but with some, some caveats. Um, I just want to make sure that between now and Friday, when this continues, because I think all around the table here for several years, all of us have said that in spirit and frankly in action in some of the things we've done, we do support uh, detasking and retasking. But I've also been one of the ones that has regularly said, and everybody kind of nods their heads when I say it, that there's probably no money to be saved by doing this. It's just how we spend it and where we spend it. But I also worried, and I don't know if, if Chief, you can deal with this now or, or somebody can be prepared for this, because I didn't see too much so far in the other budgets uh, from uh, public safety, but not that would say, here's money we can take out of the police budget, even though and I agree with the young, largely young people who are here today, that mental health issues, uh, you know, require special training, others should be dealing with those. But when they get to that state where they should have been getting help for many years, and they get to that stage where it's becoming dangerous to themselves or others, of course, police are involved and will be involved. And a number of us around this table have family and friends and neighbors that work in emergency rooms. And I don't know if you've ever been to an emergency room on a weekend, but it's a gong show. And it's a gong show because A, there's not enough people there, and B, because like police, they're dealing with things that they probably shouldn't be dealing with because nobody else is dealing with them. So they show up at emergency. But to tell those workers that work there, well, gee, we may have a constable or more security people there, or there's a knife fight in the alley, let's send in a social worker, is not what we're suggesting. But we have to make sure we're not setting that stage either. Because there are times, and again, we would love to get to that stage where these things don't happen, but they are also entitled to a safe workplace. And they, uh, so my, my worry is, and I, I'm absolutely supportive of detasking and retasking, but I'm very worried when it looks like there's it's an opportunity to save money or redirect money. I, I, I don't think that's the case necessarily, but I hope that we'll be in better, better position to discuss that on, on Friday, because I'm certainly open to, to looking at all ideas. But Chief, what I don't, <laughs> I don't want city councilors and board of police officers and, and to some extent, uh, city and, and, and even police officers to tell us what should be going on in our hospitals. <laughs> because I, I suspect that th there's, they deal with some really tough things. And I don't say that a, an officer should be there for eight to 12 hours guarding somebody, but just to throw up our hands and say, well, we'll send in somebody else to try and protect and control these people who are brought in there in various stages. It, it just, you know what I'm saying here? Let's, I don't think kind of politicians can judge what goes on in the airs, and maybe you can help me a little guidance on that. Uh, to the council. So I, I, I think, I think, and feel free to clarify, because we're sitting right next to one another, yeah. in terms of, um, so you're talking about an alternative response in terms of someone else that would be there in terms of, well, I, I think it would have to be done, I, I, I think that it would have to be done it would have to be an informed decision about who that, what is that other right. entity, right? right? Uh, I know some of the questions, I, I know some of the conversations I've had with provincial officials have been around, well, maybe it needs to be corrections type folk or sheriff type folk. Okay. People who are actually trained, right. okay. that actually, you know, um, may not carry firearms, but you right. know, are actually trained and, and that sort of thing. So okay. I, don't, I just don't think it's anybody, like, I mean, uh, clearly, but you know, the legislation was written for a reason, Yes. right? Um, and in terms of, um, you know, whatever that solution looks like. And I certainly support a solution. Yes, in terms as do of, I. Right? Yeah. Uh, I think that it has to be an informed, thoughtful decision that, that speaks to the complexities of the, of, 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 of the issue. And when you represent an area like I do that has grown so much, and some would argue is not as best protected, better, is not as well protected perhaps, in, 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 in small stuff, little stuff, as it was when it was a town, and we built a town on top of it, 
you know, I have to say. So again, all for looking at new ideas, new approaches, and trying to prevent people getting to the state there are what police and, and others have to get involved. But I am just so worried that we sometimes think we can just take money from this pot and put it in this pot. No, we're gonna to have to find money for both pots or the province is gonna to help to have us find, help us find money for both pots. That's the reality. And I hope that we'll be able to speak to that uh, a little better uh, when this comes back on Tuesday and when we talk to other, the other groups. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of things, um, uh, just that from some of the comments. So uh, further to Councillor Outhead's comments, there's no question in my mind that we, we have a lot of work to do, but this is, the fact that we're even having this kind of conversation is new in the, since this council. And the, the public safety office, the, the, the transformational study, all these reports, they're all converging at the same time with basically all the same parameters that say we all agree on, on where we need to get, we just have to get there. And, but without a doubt, our partners at the province have work to do in order to uh, legitimately al allow us to do it. Um, so we as a council, we as a board uh, need to be at those tables and I can speak for the board that we have been um, and we will continue. On the public safety piece, um, I want you to be aware that, and Chief, you'll have to remind me or one of my council mates, I know I put a motion on the floor. I think it was two or three, two officers. We asked for two officers of this complement of increased uh, uh, members to have a dedicated space for the public safety office imp um, implementation and, and, and priorities. Uh, recognizing that we can't di dictate that to uh, the chief to do that, but he has, but we want, we're showing that we need him to focus and his members to focus on these kinds of changes. Um, operationally, you know, the the day-to-day -day works at workings of of uh, criminality in our in our communities and in our city have to be tended to, but dedication to that those initiatives are imperative. So we we put that forward, um, and that was I put that forward, and that was approved. Um, so I know the chief is aware of it. So uh, our board is is in keeping with the public safety. Um, Route. What I what I would hate to see, and Councillor Oat had said it. I think Councillor Mann said it. It's not either or. It means we have to fund both. This is not a singularity uh, uh, ch a bit of change. We we and, and yes, that means we have a tough some tough decisions coming up for us as we approach April. Um, the other thing, the last thing, I need some clarification from perhaps you, uh, Jerry. Um, around what you're talking about, about the police budget being on the ballot list. If that's the only item on the ballot list and that's contractual, was that done in the past? We have contracts with unions, we have contracts everywhere. Why is that one on the ballot, or the only item that might be on the ballot, sitting there in limbo, why would that not be dealt with here? Jerry, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. So we're we're a party to the provincial contract is is one reason for that, and the other is um, again it goes to jurisdiction and the solicitor can can uh, jump in if I'm stepping off sides, but the jurisdiction of the board of police uh, isn't to uh, approve the RCMP budget. They can recommend, right? So the additional asks for the RCMP are treated as a, as a balance adjustment item as they have been in past years. So I think I'm out of time, but I'm just gonna suggest that I, just, I need clarification on why is it this is the only one when we've had other, you've, bit, you've baked everything else in, why would this not be baked in? It is a recommendation that the board did exactly what they were asked to do. Okay. So that, we we looked at that as that as I said it's a uh, we're a party to the provincial contract and uh, based on the jurisdiction of the board right that would be put forward to uh, council uh, budget committee to make a decision on that we're not automatically bound as we would be a collective agreement 
So for example, when you prove a four year collective agreement, you're approving four years. You're, you don't do that with the RCMP. So it's like an in year ask for, for, uh, for an increase. So that's why we do it that way. Councilor Kent? Yeah. I'll um, have to come back to you if yeah, you have uh, anything I'll else. I'll take this offline with Yeah, that's a good talk to Jerry, but I'm maybe offline. Councilor Lovelace? Oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Sorry, I'm good. You're good? Okay. There's nobody else on the board, so we're not going to vote on this uh, now. Uh, we are going to move to the RCMP presentation. We have some 20 minutes. Should we move to the RCMP presentation? What is Council's wish? To start fresh on Friday? I'm going to do something very democratic and I'm going to ask for a show of hands on whether we have the presentation from the RCMP now or whether we start on Friday with the RCMP. Do I? No. Ask him. Councillor Kent. Yeah. Uh, so I would ask Council to to consider uh, allowing this to happen on Friday or whenever it does it can happen. N um, often we in this Council Chamber are left with with hanging out one group or one initiative at the end of a meeting, and we do not give them the do the the opportunity to really be fulsome and have the the full engagement. If we start now, he's uh, our chief's going to have to come back and he'll start again. So we'll let's start again on the next time we have the opportunity, which is Friday, because that's that's a fresher mind. Okay, and a fresher I, I, I don't want to debate Thank this. You. I just want to show of hands and we'll make a decision. So, uh, Councillor Outhead, on a point of. But just a, just a question. I mean, does the world end if we extend the meeting to 4:30? Yeah, I think that there are people that have commitments at 4 o'clock. That's why we have. Sorry, people have commitments at 4 o'clock. Uh, all right. All right. I mean, we, we schedule these things, and we do have lots of time, folks. It's we're not approving a budget for two months, so we have contingency days built in. We, if we don't get to planning and development, we'll do it. Uh, next week, or you guys can do it while I'm on vacation, for that matter. But um, so I want to vote. Those who want to wait till Friday to begin the presentation, let me see your hands. That's what we're going to do. We're going to wait till Friday. Jeff, you're going to come back anyway. Are you okay? Um, thank you. Thank you to uh, the chief. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been uh, presenting. Um, it was a relatively long day after a relatively long day yesterday, so maybe a fresh set of eyes on Friday morning might not be such a, a bad thing. Correct. There'll be no more public participation. That's, this will be a continuation of this. Unless we go to public planning and development or some other the, new... There is, a, there is a public participation section for the existing meeting that was scheduled for Friday. So it will be there and it will happen before the RCMP presentation. If we get to the next department, if we get to the next thing on Friday. It starts at the beginning of the meeting. It's the same meeting. There's no, but there's no, we've already done public participation for police. We don't have to do that again. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll accept a motion to adjourn this meeting. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. The presentation. I think we could have done it.